I wish I had I wish I had more time myself, but we try try and fill in uh, get that uh, get as much time and play that Thursday night game and then play an occasional Saturday night game. Yeah. So and we got one next Saturday. So yeah, thanks yeah. to modern uh, tools that you can play online. I'm actually playing two three games a week often. So so that that's yeah. And yeah, I can I'm work and play at the same time. I can do my mapping while I'm, I'm playing. So that that kind of keeps me at my desk. So some of, some of the folks at work have been doing a lot with the online with the, uh, the yeah. online uh, tool sets. And I just like it's get like home and I'm like, oh god, I've been doing this all day. I'm just tired. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, I have hobbies that are not game related, <laughs> rather know, than game related. Like, Wait a so, minute, yeah. I've got I've got gardening and I've got miniatures yeah. to paint, and I've got <laughs> yeah. So so I kind of yeah. That, that's the, the thing. It's um, it's a lot. I mean, uh, if I if I didn't have my one friend doing the crafting and the miniature painting and stuff, I mean, we'd have a lot less on that table. It's just I have yeah. terrible. Terrible. What's up there, Troy? Bo uh, Monkey? What's going on, everyone? Whoops, I hit the wrong button. See, Jay okay. hit the wrong button already. One yeah, wrong button good. already. I'm 0 for 1. So, my apologies, sir. Eh. I know it happens all the time, man, and yep. the technology. So. Oh. Uh, so, um, we'll have to ask the Zeb uh, um, how the Zeb name came about, but Dave, uh, uh, David, uh, so uh, it sounds like you're still working, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, um, I work full-time. Uh, so I've been working on at, uh, at ZeniMax Online. Oh, okay. So you're still in the video computer game business. Oh, yeah. I've been in video games now since 90. Or something like that. Wonderful. Very, very so where, cool. Where in the world are you located now? I'm in, I'm in Baltimore, Maryland. Oh, oh wow. Dude, I'm in, I'm in South Jersey, so you're an hour and a half from me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right up by 95. Yeah, I'm in Southern California. Nice. Uh, yeah. Okay. I yeah. used to be in Southern California many, many years ago. Moved around very cool. A lot during yeah. the video game period. Yeah, you, you a Ravens see. fan at all, or...? Uh, I'm not much of a football person, so you know, it's kind of like whatever. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you, 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 you and, and Mike Bridges are sporty fans. Yeah. The rest yeah, of us Eagles, in the game, Flyers. we don't even know what's going on. When they say a team, I don't even know it. Yeah. And, yeah. Even after living here ten years, I'm, I'm a Swedish expat moved to California ten years ago. I don't know. Watch something appropriately violent like curling or something like that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Burning through the sponsors here, everyone. Trying. Yeah. yeah, they're getting so long that you have to start the show earlier and earlier just to go through. All well, the you time. know, and I just want to <laughs> run run through these. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so Gamescape just came out with their monthly Patreon on for May, and they got a ton of dressings for their th for three the three D printers. Awesome stuff. Like stuff that finishes out a dungeon, you know. Uh, a lot of cool accessory items, which is really neat. So I was really happy to see that. Yeah. He's a one-man show, so. Yeah, David, if you just maximize my screen, you, you, you see everything that uh, the people on Twitch yep. are seeing live. And, yeah. You know, so there you go. Yeah, cool. I gotta figure that, that part out. Yeah. All right, cool, yeah. man. Uh, look at all the nice toys. I can use all those nice toys for oh, yeah. miniatures games. <laughs> yep. We, uh... We love our toys with our miniatures. Uh, just uh, you know, when we started playing, when we were kids, we had to we had to grab paper with the dry erase markers, the erasable markers, you know, that we oh, yeah. put on the vinyl mats, and we had figures that, from the Grenadier sets that weren't painted, right? You know, that's what we yeah, had. Graph paper. Graph paper. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, Mike? That's what we had, and uh, we had testers paint enamel, and that was terrible for them, and. Uh, <laughs> Back in the day. So. Here comes the big one. This is Infinite Dimensions. And these guys are these guys are from Toronto. And these guys crank out some unbelievable content. So. Um, and this Kickstarter is shipping now. 
Hopefully everyone's good tonight. Uh, thank you. There's a ton of people on already online. I really appreciate it. Wow, 3D. Yeah. Wait. Yeah, it, wait to see this. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. So yeah. Look at the size of this thing. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. This is, you know, this is like, okay. And in a year, your first print will be done. <laughs> it takes yeah, months. Like, it ta it takes. So we had a, uh, David. We had a um. And he's on Retro Gamer Meth, uh, Mike Saxon. I think he's got six 3D printers. And uh, from the other company, Gamescape, we have a ruined castle that he printed for us. And it took him four 3D printers, 28 days, to print all the parts for it. He shipped it to us. Now my guy Bill is priming it, painting it. Figure we'll have it on the table maybe in two, two months because it's so huge. It's like two and a half feet by two and a half feet. But. Um, yeah, I got a big plan for it in, uh, in our Greyhawk, so. Yeah. But this stuff is unbelievably cool, and we're working on getting this printed out, too, now. The, the, and the arena, I'm going to use the arena that you're going to see here for the uh, Free City of Greyhawk arena. So, it's uh, the next picture coming up, set pictures coming up. But that one hasn't been released yet from the Kickstarter, but it's like... I love that bridge. It's beautiful, <laughs> isn't it? It's beautiful content. Here comes the fighting pits. There it is. Fighting pits. Yeah. So can't wait to get that out. I think Pat ever got those fighting pits. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> yes, Big Mac. You got it. It's going to be awesome. Awesome discussion tonight. Shout out, shout out, shout outs. I will hit wrong buttons tonight. I'm just, it's just, uh, it's, it's the yeah, way I am this evening. Part of the thing, yeah. So I got some cool giveaways uh, tonight too for this one. Um, and these will be courtesy of, of course, Canadian Ancient Gamer and myself. I got, so we got some, uh, uh, got some from uh, DM's Guild, some uh, David Cook, uh, publications and reprint for people to give it we'll give them away so I'll talk about that when i get online here we can make that like the second question mac <laughs> we can make that the second question all right let's hit up an entry screen here right if we come on a few minutes early no one's going to yell at us except gary holy and who always yells why yeah, starting he early he needs to come here yeah he needs to be on time That's our that's our heraldry for my uh, the, the night. It's called the Order of Ulick. So I got my own knighthood in Greyhawk. Started in 1980. Uh, the 41's the number of years we've been playing. We get to campaign. Uh, most you know, one of my friends goes back to 78. David, the uh, rest are like 80, 83. So and the rookie is from 92. So and we stream that on Thursday nights. <laughs> I think there was some site that was selling those. Yeah, like you can do it. You are now layered. Get your quilt for the pattern. Kill the system. Yeah, Bill's a rookie forever. <laughs> well, Brett, Brett Kingstein, you, you get it, man. I mean, the, you know, us old schoolers, we go way back, right? All of us. Yeah. Yeah, he said 82. I mean, yeah. you gotta understand. Yeah. 82. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. you know, like I said, I started in 78 and we were just playing basic D&D stuff. We didn't have a campaign, we are just running adventures. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we really started the campaign officially in 1980, so. I'm trying to think. I think I started playing in 75, I think. Wow. Shortly, yeah, it was like shortly yeah. after the first box sets came out. Um, yeah. 75. And we had no idea what we were doing. Yeah. But that's, that's, a, that's the we, fun we, we thing. We didn't have either. Yeah. We had a, a bunch of Xerox copies of, of, I think it was the Red Box or something. No, it was, it was set of guys basic. for the whole party. 
it wasn't even that then 75. It was the white three white books. Oh yeah, yeah but it was, it was the old it was the old original three books. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. We, Holmes Basic 78, correct, Dave? Um, I think so, yeah. 77 or 78 was Holmes Basic, and that was the what I learned off of, and it either had keep, it either had um, In Search of the Unknown or Keep on the Borderlands in it. And I had a Chits edition. I didn't even have dice in mine. I believe we had one set of dice for the week. And we didn't know anyone else. It was someone who's been here in America and got a sealer's copy of the One more edition. minute will come on. And, and then we played with that on one set of dice, and then there was a book story to drop the book to sell stuff like the two later. So then we could buy our first copy, and we could get the set of dice each, and, and, and then we got players' hand books. And then you I remember kind of going into the college bookstore and finally finding it on the shelf. Yep. Because, again, we didn't have hobby shops. Vocalized Fury, there was a wave of, of, of both in Sweden and Norway of, of game races. So there were several stores that and, and stuff that opened that, that we were kind of early for me in Europe, I think, early on the race. So were you Sweden or Norway? Sweden, um, yeah, uh -huh. but we, it was close My to wife Sweden. My wife will be very happy to know that. Okay, cool. <laughs> She's got Swedish ancestry somewhere, uh -huh. she's very yeah. proud about it. <laughs> awesome. Very, very cool. Good evening, everyone. I'm J.K. Lukasumba for another Gabin tonight. We're sitting by the fire at uh, Lord Peaks Haven in Tring Lee. And I uh, got Anna Meyer, the great, um, wonderful Hello. Anna Meyer, with me as always, my partner in crime. And welcome tonight, a true, I mean, a legend. Yep. I'm so excited about this discussion. Uh, <laughs> uh, David Zeb Cook, welcome. Oh, again, I got to get the right hand up. <laughs> <It's> okay. <Yeah. laughs> and happy birthday. Well, yeah. thank you. Yes. <laughs> 65th. Does it sound good, everyone out there? Please let me know if it sounds okay and, and just where we're set here. Um, thank you so very much for coming on tonight and just chatting with us. Let's have some fun with this. We're going to we're gonna have a, a great discussion here, go over some really unbelievable accomplishments uh, that David has been a part of all this time. Um, some wonderful, wonderful things. Uh so here's the first question, and Big Mac asked this uh, from the Piazza and the UK. We'll get this out of the way. How's the name Zeb come about? So it, it's basically, before I started working at uh, TSR, I was a school teacher. And uh, I was a high school English teacher. And some of my students decided that I looked like some character in a TV Western uh, who was named Zeb. And so they started calling me that just because, you know, kids will, you know, find, will try and find something to upset. Bonanza? Was it Bonanza? It, it failed. It, no, it wasn't Bonanza. It was some, some later one. Okay. It failed, it failed miserably for them because basically <laughs> I didn't object. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I kind of figured that, you know, they could call me a whole lot worse things. Yeah. <laughs> And so, uh, and so then when I got to TSR, um, that, the fact that, you know, there was uh, David Sutherland, and then there was uh, David LaForce, who was, uh, went by, went by the nickname Diesel. Yeah. And then I was like the third David there. And they said, you know, you're going to need a nickname or we're never going to be able to tell you apart. Um and again, so kind of figuring like it's better to choose one than to, mm -hmm. to let people pick one. Well, I said, you know, yeah, okay, just call me Zeb because that's what you know, my students used to call me. In. And uh, that stuck. Plus, I have this really awful signature where uh, my uh, first name looks like kind of like a, a scribbled out Z with a bunch of other things on it. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, so... After doing that for, you know, internally, just with that nickname for many years, and, you know, if you look a lot of the early product, it still would say David Cook, this sort of stuff. Uh, one of the editors said, you know, you need to like, you know, you should go, you should go by Zeb because mm -hmm. it's a lot more memorable and, you know, and, but I didn't want to just suddenly become Zeb Cook in print. So that's where the David quote Zeb Cook thing came about. Yeah. Um, Very cool. And, and so that's, yeah. And so ever since it's stuck, I have literally, you know, when I go to a new job and I've gone to a bunch of new jobs since I left TSR, uh, 
that, you know, they ask, well, what do you want? And I say, eh, just call me Zeb or, you know, you can call me Dave, but really it's a lot easier just to call me Zeb um, because, you know, it's more memorable. And I have wound up like with uh, receptionists at who I, you know, worked at a company for years and they'll get a call looking for a guy named David Zeb, David Cook, and they won't know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, literally, it was the last place I had been working there 10 years. And about, you know, two or three years ago, one of the receptionists said, I got a call for David Cook. Is that you? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Well, that's a good story. So it's not your middle name is not Zebediah. Some not people. A, nothing. Okay. Nothing at all. <laughs> yeah. That is that's that's a that's a good that's a good story to hear. So it's how the West was won, according to one of the viewers here. Ah, oh, there we from. go. That would. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I've always had, I've always been afraid to go look at what the character was because it was probably like some horrible like. You know. <laughs> so I'm going to set up the giveaway, and here's what we're going to do. Uh, I, I, my guess is there's going to be three, but we're going to do at least two. So these are reprints, and uh, one says Zeb one here. So I have, I have this one, the Temple of Death. By David Cook, all right, X5, cool. And we also have a really cool second edition book of artifacts. This one says David Zeb Cook on it. Now, I have something coming that's not here yet to give away as well, and that will be this in his reprint as well. I have a Dwellers of the Forbidden City I1. This goes way back. So I will have those three, okay? So let me set up the giveaways for everyone tonight. And please note, subs always get the bonus tickets, and uh, we'll rack and uh, we're having some fun. There's some a lot of cheering going on tonight. There, so you you prefer Zeb or David tonight, or either? Uh, Zeb's easier. Zeb, okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Zeb, we got a lot of cheers coming on. We got a lot of uh, people are really excited, and uh, this is going to be a blast of a discussion. So why don't we start at the beginning and like, how'd you get hooked into TSR back in the day? And you're saying you're playing it from 1975, so yeah, sort of. Well, I was playing. I was playing before that. I was playing uh, basically a lot of war games, a lot of you know paper, you know hexagon counter kind of you know hexagon map yeah. war game kind of things, that sort of stuff. Were you playing with Len at all in his war gaming community? No, no, no. I was, okay. I was. I was in the Midwest. Grew up okay. in the Midwest, and uh, and so had started playing when I was in uh, high school and then went off to college and discovered there was an active game group. And so we were playing these, you know, you know, hugely elaborate, you know, war game simulation things. And then one day, um, one of the guys kind of said, hey, yeah, you know, there's this game that one, you know, that one of, we're, we've been running and that maybe you'd, maybe you'd like to try it out. And uh, so it's like, you know, it's like, the secret group out of the war game group, you know, it's like went off to play and got introduced to my first session of Dungeons and Dragons where I made my first character. It was a dwarf. And I think I named him Fred 9801 <laughs> on the principle that, that all of the, there had been a Fred 980, uh, Fred 1 through 9800, <laughs> but they'd all died before him. <laughs> and, um, and uh, yeah, we, we did tremendously, you know, just go down into the dungeon hole, find treasure and did things horribly terrible. And, the, you know, it's like, yeah, we found this treasure. It's like, you know, there were like, you know, we were all like fourth, third, low, third and fourth level characters. And, you know, the guy rolled up on the, the, the monster layer treasure tables and there was like, you know, tens of thousands of gold and stuff in this thing. And it's like, and we're like, oh, great. This is wonderful. And then he said, yeah, how are you going to get it out? <laughs> <laughs> who, who was the end for you? I'm sorry, that first time. Oh, it was a guy named Wolfgang. Okay. Um, I think, I'm pretty sure that was who it was. Okay. And this was an old. Uh, wasn't Wolfgang uh, Bauer a different Wolfgang? No, no. Okay. Wasn't, no. Yeah. No. Very cool. Yeah. And that, what year is this? This was probably about 74. Five, I think, yeah. might have been late seventy four, seventy five, um, somewhere, somewhere not long after this game, and I, you know, wound up going up to uh, uh, Lake Geneva for one of the Gen Con, one one of the you know mm -hmm. really early Gen Cons at the Horticulture Hall. Oh. Um, yeah, and that was that was the year that Judges Guild put out the. Uh, uh, City of the Invincible Overlord. Oh, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was like, oh my God, look at these gigantic maps and, and completely sketchy descriptions of everything. But it's got gigantic maps. Yeah. <laughs> and, 
And so every, you know, you had to have it. And, and yeah. then you had to try and figure, well, what am I going to do with it now? <laughs> it was so open. You had Thunder Hole, you had the Dwarven Hold in there, and you had all sorts of things. And it wasn't complete, but it was complete enough, right? You know? My friend still it, was, yeah. it would have big maps. It's, that was mm -hmm. the biggest thing. It was like yeah. big maps and descriptions that didn't that would that were, had no logical sense and tables <laughs> and yeah. and uh, you know like uh, it's just kind of like oh we need a table here okay let's okay, let's put in a random table for something right right but you know it was it was none of you us know, knew any better about kind of you know, like how to you know. Yeah, it was they, the old mega dungeons. It, it was yeah, the biggest monsters were in the basement when they had no chance of getting in or out or anything. Yeah. It was like yeah. yeah, yeah, you never went in any basement because there was always something horrible in mm -hmm. it, right? Yep. But it did let me then, you know, really start kind of moving from just, oh look, we're gonna go out to a dungeon and do a lot more of like, oh look, we're gonna do things in a city and then that that really kind of you know forces you to kind of like stretch your storytelling and stuff. And it just, I guess it was just a whole new experience coming from the war game end. It was so open-ended and you had like, you know, a lot of descriptive nature. Yeah, I was it. a theater minor and an English major, so in college, so. You oh, know. so you, you could <laughs> adapt to the. Uh, so yeah, this was, this was like, okay, I'm good with this. <laughs> Very cool. Cool. So yeah. it was one step and a jump from Gen Con to TSR or was it? No. So from there, well, you know, when you have an English major, um, you quickly discover that there is only one occupation for which you can get a job, Writing. which is you go become an English teacher. And yeah. so I wound up being an English teacher in a very, very small town in Nebraska uh, and uh, was there for two years. And one day, uh, I think it was the Dragon Magazine ran that kind of, kind of semi-legendary now, Add that they were looking for for uh, designers, and if you go back into the old CD-ROM copies of it, you can actually find mm -hmm. that ad, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, my wife uh, basically encouraged me to go ahead and give this a go because uh, she was she was a uh, she was a gamer too. Um, and I'm being attacked by a cat down here. Oh, Excuse it's okay. Me. I want to. <laughs> yeah, we have. Yeah, I have a doggy here. So, yeah. yep. but. Um, so she, she, she encouraged me to go ahead and give this a try. So I basically wrote in and you had to provide a writing sample. And then you had this list of questions that they had because they had to come up with some kind of screening test, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, and it was, it was a, just a completely bizarre list of questions of, you know, <laughs> I can't even remember them now, but it was like, you know, noble titles from you know various things and you know identify all of these different you know you know pole arms mm -hmm. yeah you know, completely not <laughs> useful information actually at all for anything related to like oh i gotta yeah. do i gotta put together an adventure but yeah you know it's fortunately you know i remember oh wait dragon did a big article on pole arms at one point with pictures yeah, and that pulled was... that all out mm -hmm. and all this sort of stuff okay. and was uh very surprised uh when they said yes you know we'd like to we'd like to have you out for an interview so when can you come well i was a teacher i was a high school teacher in a little town in the middle of nowhere nebraska and uh they wanted me to fly out on my own dime and uh which basically i didn't have a dime to do this <laughs> and so i had to persuade them that they had to buy the ticket so i could come out otherwise it wasn't going to happen yeah. um and so i uh, flew out there and basically you fly, you fly, flew into Chicago and then took some, uh, you know, shuttle up to uh, Lake Geneva and get dropped off on the corner of uh, downtown Lake Geneva. And I'm just kind of standing there, you know, kind of like not knowing, well, what do I do now? And the, dun the dungeon hobby shop is there and they just say, yeah, somebody will be by to pick you up. <laughs> and eventually, uh, uh, Gary Gagax's wife, drives up in a stage wagon uh, and Gary's with her. We get in. I'm not sure if we go get something to eat or not, but eventually all the, the interview involved going back to his house and being going through lots of questions because there really weren't a lot of people there uh, at the time. I think that was about the 24th employee when I did get hired. Uh, and um, instead of putting me up at a hotel, I wound up spending the night on Gary's couch on his porch i think wow 
<laughs> That's the way to get hired. <laughs> um, you know, and then went the next day, met, you know, got shown the, the offices, got, you know, met with people there and did what kind of sort of passed for an interview. And uh, then, yeah, then I came back home and I had no idea how I'd done, except that uh, a few weeks or so later, a month or so later, I got called up and said, hey, would you like to come work? So, wow. you know, I delayed it long enough to finish out the school year, and then we were out of there. Wow. What, what year was this? That would have been 1979. Okay. Okay. So, Which fits right in with when some of these publications you started writing came out. Yeah, I, I yeah. joined in, like, the 6th of June, I think it was. <laughs> A day that will live in infamy. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That, that is was awesome. The, the, before TSR had had they really started that first growth spurt to become a, a big game publisher? I, were they still small and and they were still little... small. They had twenty four mm -hmm. people. They had put out a, you know they had put out the basic uh, Hill Giant series modules, this sort yeah. of stuff. Um, and uh, Lawrence Schick had been hired as a design as a designer, so he became kind of the the head of design, which you know nobody even knew what that meant, yeah. uh, of the design department. They didn't even know what a design department really was, but they were going to build one. Uh, and I think there was one other person who had been hired before, uh, shortly before me as, as a designer who didn't last. And but uh, so, yeah. Uh, and like I said, I was, I was employee number 24 at the time when I got hired. And that included hobby shop. That included, yeah. you know, Gary and everybody else, and so yeah, we were pretty. We were a really small group. Yeah. So again, some bizarre questions from the audience. Like, were you salaried? <laughs> yes, my salary. I won't. I won't reveal what it was exactly, but let's just say I was working as a teacher in a state that was ranked in like the like. 48th or 47th of the uh, of the lowest paying state you know it was like way down at the bottom end of you know teacher salary pay right yeah. so when i went to tsr i took a pay cut okay it was, it was horrible well <laughs> you're not the only one everyone in, in, yeah. in the gaming industry except stefan Porcorni. well yeah, he's, yeah. yeah so uh um how was life up in lake geneva yeah uh, well it was way better than than uh the it was, you know, I have fond memories of our time in Nebraska, but Lake yeah. Geneva was like a freaking big city compared to it. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, cool. You know, even though it was only like, you know, 10,000 people or something right. like that, that 5,000 yeah. people. But, uh, um, and, uh, you know, the, but the place I had been was 300 people. So, uh, and so, yeah, and the thing is, uh, I was suddenly now working in with a whole bunch of other people all very, all like-minded people yeah uh you know we were all basically very passionate about games we all uh we were all basically had a lot of things in common because you know if you're passionate about tsr it's because you probably liked x y and z yeah and so we had a lot of things like that in common uh we were all young um and uh we also had no clue what we were doing <laughs> Was it? And so there was both, both we, business-wise, or and, and also the game was early. No one uh, yeah, really knew what it was. Wise, and, no game and, was. Yeah. and we didn't. And we were a design department that you know we had this kind of model of uh, the the modules that Gary had, had put out and the stuff that Judges Guild was doing. So we had that as kind of a rough model. And you know, there were some other companies that were doing stuff, but really we had no idea of like. Yeah. schedules or how much you know how much product should we do or what kind of product which should yeah. we do or was there a lot of, of debate between like different ideas of where to take the game or design wise or, or play styles and stuff like that or, or um not not so much about where to take the game at that point because it was more like what well, what kind of product should we make you know should yeah. we do more mm -hmm. modules or yeah oh wow we've got you know somebody has this great idea the biggest challenge was um we would have, a, you know, we, we as you know, young ear designers would have a lot of great ideas. Uh, and then it was trying to figure out like, well, which ones of these are actually good ideas? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the, wow, that sounds really cool, but no, we yeah. don't want to do that. <laughs> um, and then the other, the other challenge was, is that um, Gary, and Gary, you know, had 
had to kind of approve everything. And so you, know, yeah. you had to make sure you came up with something that he thought was also a good idea. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that was a bit unpredictable. Um, but- so you were basically an adventure writer or a, a an editor. What was your title? I was mostly point? I was mostly a writer. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, we had we had um, separate editors. Steve Winter was the first editor that I think we okay. had on staff, mm-hmm. and he yeah. actually started before me slightly. Um, and yeah, my, my mind you mostly mostly at this point when we say people started before me, it was like a matter of months or weeks before. You know? Right. Um, and. Um, so, so yeah, mostly I was, I was doing uh, mostly adventure writing and that sort of stuff. But at the same time, uh, we all got called in to deal with, you know, oh, somebody's got to take care of this. So I did an editing and packaging pass on uh, when we did a reissue of Awful Green Things from Outer Space. I, I basically got handed that to sort that out and kind of redo the rules so that they would be Oh, you know, cool. easier to understand that sort of thing yeah. um and then a lot of times it was like oh yeah we need this we need this uh later on it's like we need like the the rogues guild which was just a booklet rogues of guild. npcs yeah. right yeah Ooh. somebody's got to put that together you put that together you know um that I, sort of thing i even saw you did you did the escape from new york set the game the escape from new york <laughs> game yes <laughs> yeah i saw that so, so the escape from new york game Basically, when the movie was, you know, in production, yeah, I think it was seventy-eight, uh, and I was can't remember the, what the year that gallery? was. Yeah, that's was Rogue's Gallery. Rogue's Gallery. That's, that's yeah, Rogue's yeah. Gallery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, in fact, yeah. Uh, in the yeah. back are characters that we used in in our own campaign. Absolutely. That's so. why I bought this one because there there <laughs> are Tensor, great Big characters. B, and, and yeah, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, Phoebus, uh, yeah. the lizard man who got reincarnated. Yep. Yeah. Some great so stuff. yeah, you know, and you can kind of guess from that how non-standard our own games were. <laughs> mm-hmm. Happy birthday! Oh, here we go! Cake and so, stuff. Happy awesome. To you. Here, go Lean for down. it! No, we're Lean good. Down. You can come on in. in. Get your head in. Here. Come on in. Yeah, uh, <laughs> my wife won't go on stream either. You got to get way over. From... You know, nobody can see you yet. Right. <laughs> this is my wife. She's trying to hear. Here, here. We'll, what's, uh, what's her we'll name? Get her in view. Awesome. If you know, you know, lean, 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 lean. There we Welcome. are. Hey. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much for being understanding to have uh, exactly. Zeb on during his birthday here. Birthday we can cake. borrow him for a bit. Yep. 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 This is awesome. Right. So thank you. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's Cape from New York. <laughs> when that movie came out, I can't remember exactly when that movie came out. It was in the early 80s at some yeah, point. Yeah, it must have been 80. I, was I thought it was in the 70s, but... no? It was late seventies, but I could be wrong. I think it no, was no, 70s. No. It had to be early eighties okay. because in seventy nine yeah. we were not touching anything like that. Okay. But they, they, we got offered the license for to do a game for it. Okay. Um, and so at that point, it was like we need a game for us, and they needed it really fast. They needed this game designed really fast because you know we had to get it all done in time, so it'd be out when the movie came out and all this sort of stuff, and so. Uh, I got, I don't know if I was, you know, foolish enough to volunteer or if I just got tasked with the job. Uh, and so it's like, quick, we need a game for this. And so it became like, all uh, right, how do I do this? I had a week to design the game. Wow. We basically kind of, it's kind of basically a ripoff of clues set on a map of New York. And so <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> Uh, but it was actually kind of a fun game to play, <laughs> yeah. and we all got to we all got to go to a private showing of the movie, and then we realized, wow, we are so this is like yeah, if we sell any, we're going to be doing good. Ernest yeah. Borgnine, wow, <laughs> Snake Pliskin, wow, uh, yeah, that movie's that movie's such a cult classic, The Duke of New York. Yeah, it was just such a great movie. So, campy. but it was fun to do. Yeah, we had a good mm-hmm. time. So I jumped ahead. Because I thought it was like 79. My apologies for that. Now we're going to have a huge bunch of... Uh, a huge. Thank you, Patrick, for all the uh, gift subs. All right. So these are the... F- I, I try to go in chronological order as, as and for stuff scrolling through here, uh, Zeb. And these are the first two I came up with. And that is... And I don't know which one of the two were first. But Slave Pits of the Undercity or Dwellers of the Forbidden City seem to be your first uh, two. Slave Pits, I believe, was first. Okay. So... And this is this is a competition series. Yeah. Was this so, one at Gen Con, nineteen eighty? 
Yeah, so it was, it was run at Gen Con 1980. Part of it was that the previous year, the uh, every year before that, the it had they had this AD and D open thing, which was a multi-tiered tournament thing, and the best teams would then go on to the final. Um, and every year before that, they had always let outside, um, you know, groups do it. You know, um, write the adventure and do all that sort of stuff. They never thought like, oh yeah, we should. Uh, you know, we should actually like put this together and um 79 apparently the the adventure didn't go would didn't didn't go well or it was wasn't really that great of a, a great of a tournament um and so uh lauren chick said you know you know why are why are we letting other people do this this is our this is uh this is our brand and everything we should we should we should be doing this and had the great you know had the brilliant idea <laughs> that uh that we should do this in-house and uh, that we would each design it and then not only that but we would then um because there was first round was like on thursday second round was on uh then the second uh uh part two of the first round was on friday and then the the semi-final would, was on saturday and on sunday was a final and that we would print up modules and then actually have them for sale the day after they were done. Wow, that's a good idea. They were run. Oh yeah, it was a nightmare. Because <laughs> 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 it was just, you know, coordination and planning, anything that has to like go that clock right. is, you know, really, really challenging. But it meant that first off, you know, so we had to, first we had to design the adventure, the, the uh, tournaments. Um, and that was divided up between four of us, myself, uh, Harold Johnson, Alan Hammock, and then Lawrence did the final. Um, and the first trick, trick was just making sure that these were all kind of balanced and equal to each other because like the first two rounds had to be, you know, equal, more or less of equal difficulty and all this sort of stuff. So we had to work out this whole like formula of like, okay, there will be nine encounters and like one will be a basic, you know, first we'll, you know, there'll be like three basic encounters and then we'll have, there will have to be a basic encounter with a trap and then there'll have to be an encounter with a trick and then there's going to be an encounter with a new monster and, you know, and so we have these kind of definitions and then we all wrote our adventures and tried to see if they were actually in any way, you know, parallel to them. We play tested them. I have to say that, uh, Playing the final that Lawrence did in the area of the slave lords uh, gave me one of my uh, favorite m memory moments from uh, from basically kind of a role playing thing, which was taking your seventh and eighth level characters and having them in terror of kobolds <laughs> because you got thrown into the you got thrown nothing. into this pit and you had nothing, <laughs> and the kobolds had sharp sticks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, who did you did you co collaborate on the idea for all? Uh, oh yeah, we had to, yeah. we had to make sure that we had the storylines all worked, everything all kind of yeah. meshed together. Right. And so we kind of collaborated on all that, put it all out, uh, got it written, and then you had to you had to write it, and then also expand. You had to take the basic adventure, the basic tournament part you did, and then expand it into a proper module, and then that was what was sold. Um, and we did that once, and we decided we're never doing that again. <laughs> but you but it was a lot of fun but you created something that's iconic from you know that there's so much that this that, that's written about this post right i mean the slavers is so i so iconic and the the, the diesel artwork on this is b beautiful you know <laughs> yeah. it is yeah. it is so it's so wonderful <laughs> and I, so i found through one of our viewers an article you actually wrote about this on how to survive your part Let's see if I can God, find it. I don't even remember. Right yeah, now. <laughs> so here it is. It's called. So, whoops. Let me get rid of that one. Remove survival <laughs> tips for slave pits. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I got too much up here. Yep. And there it is by Dave Cook. And uh, here's the. Uh, and it shows how they all lies. You know. Yeah. It shows the winners <laughs> of all of, of the, that group. Yeah. yeah and it, it tells you how you know some 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 things in this and uh you know contestants to a mirror 135 semi-finalists teams only 45 finalists and then there was yeah so it sounds like this was massive you know it was just, is, you know i mean when you got 800 players going through all one event that was yeah that, yeah that so, sounds pretty big deal i uh, i don't know what dragon i think i sure got this for me lomas i'll have to figure it out but look it's got to be 1980 it's got to be june or it's july of 1980 yeah it's got to be right in that time frame yeah. so um 
you know, afterwards. Well, but and, list the winners. Yep. Then it has to be after August. Okay, so look for August uh, of 1980 because plus. August, and probably a couple months after August because of just the time delay to do the magazine. Okay. So um, Michael Lange was named Best Adventurer. And then, uh, do we know any of the names of any of these? I don't. I don't know any of those people. I was Excuse wondering. Me while if, I eat cake. Yeah, I oh, keep. Yeah, that's good, man. Enjoy, yeah. it, enjoy it. Hey, like I said, I have my birthday for my son. My son turns eleven tomorrow. Hey, gotta enjoy it. Gotta enjoy yeah. those birthdays. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for that sub shift. Um, thank you so very much. So uh, yeah, that was cool. So it was a collaboration between all four of you. Yep. Uh, and uh, was Gary happy with it? Um, far as I know, good. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, he was not. He was for a lot of things. He was not directly involved in, like, uh, you know, evaluating, you know, individual modules and right. sort of that. He was. He was more often either working on his own projects, or was very busy, just kind of like you now trying to run a company, and that was a whole new adventure for him too. Um, especially one that was basically going through the crazy period of growth that we had. I was just going to say that it kind of exploded there for some years. And, yeah. yeah, it was, it exploded like mad. It kept them all very busy and, and uh, it, it led to future problems for the company. But. Yeah. So after that comes, and I'm not sure if I know what I, the I represents when you did I one dwellers. Intermediate. Dwellers. Intermediate. Oh, there you go. Level four seven. Mm -hmm. It was, okay. it was the, this is the kind of, you know, six to seven, ninth level kind of character kind of okay. thing is what's the yeah. idea. And I see um, in this that you like the uh, judges go concept of a big map, right? Cause yeah. you got a nice big oh, map wonderful. in this yeah, one. I, 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 I I loved doing big maps that I could just kind of say, and here's stuff, figure it out yourself. <laughs> Very cool. Um, being a professional map maker, it's wonderful to hear that people. Well, they're having professional map makers do it because I'm a terrible map maker myself. <laughs> um, but um, that was actually, that actually contains bits and pieces of the original um, stuff that I sent in as part of my job application. Oh, oh so it okay. Came later. Yeah, cool. Well, so um, the uh, the final temple stuff, some of the stuff that, you know, in the final encounter areas is was the original because I did this little very Conan-esque kind of temple for my uh, mm -hmm. uh, application. And yeah. then I think the 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 Tasloy and the Yuan T came out were were part of that too because you know you can't have a good jungle adventure without snake men. So you, you created the Yuan T. Yeah. Is that yeah. you you created the Yuan T? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How about the Abolith? The Abolith in here. Did you create the Abolith? Oh, oh yeah, I created the Abolith too. Really? That, that is me such just being mad as a hatter. <laughs> that is that is oh, awesome. To icon. Yellow must creep. No, okay. Come on, the Abolith is kind of an unplayable thing. I don't know why people like it so much. Because <laughs> it's so <laughs> nasty. Exactly, it's nasty. It's an alien, and they're kind of smart. aliens, and 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 yeah, so so they're kind of spooky, scary things that don't function like humanoids or any of that. Yeah, they were stuff. they were they were definitely like you know if you're going to run in one of these, I figure it would kill most of the party because they would never figure out what was going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, the yellow musk creeper, yours. Um, no, the yellow musk okay. creeper was okay. taken okay. from the fiend folio. Okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, and that was basically the collection of stuff that had been uh, done for uh, the, uh, oh, what was the, ma the magazine, the UK magazine. That, White Dwarf. That, uh, it was a white dwarf. It was, but what was before white dwarf? There was. Uh, I'm not sure which one, but it, yeah, no, yeah. the UK was. It might have come in, out, of, a lot, yeah. but a lot of it might have come out of the old white, the old white dwarf before white dwarf became completely a GW thing. Zeb, yeah. uh, by the way, Luke Gygax is on watching and just commented oh. in chat. Hello, Luke. Good evening. Hello, Luke. Thank Wonderful. you for coming on, Luke. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're we're reminiscing about gr uh, what a great contributor to to the game here, Zeb, and it's mm -hmm. just a wonderful discussion, and thank you so very much oh, for so hopping on. So, uh, a question came up. What, why was it called the A-Series, the Slavers? It was just you wanted to start at the beginning with it? Um, yeah, thank you, Patrick. That we, we, we figured, hey, that'll put us at the head of the list of the, of the back of the, of the okay. listings. Oh. Um, and, and, you know, it was the airy of the Slave Words was the final, so, you know, A seemed like a good thing. We hadn't, you know, 
We were using up other letters of the alphabet like mad, so hey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, there are such iconic creatures. The Zorn are in here, Dwellers of the Forbidden City, Tazloy. I mean, just wonderful. Yeah. One, rust monsters, wonderful things. Yep. Um, carnivorous apes, one of my favorite things. Carnivorous apes. Yeah, so, I wish I'd thought of those. those, are, yeah, but those yeah, a, lo a lot of fiend folio creatures are in here. Yeah, uh -huh. because it's, we were trying, we were, um, fiend folio was, was, out at the time and so we were trying to also like leverage you know hey these are cool things from this other book kind mm -hmm. of a thing right yep. you know we, we, were, we were not above shamelessly cross marketing and cross promotion oh no, that's that's a good good idea but it was interesting back then there was a lot more competitive modules they were supposed to play at a convention to win a tournament so to speak that the competitiveness seems to have been dialed down in, in more yeah modern. we did we did that we yeah. did hidden shrine of tomorrow and that was harold johnson did that one yeah. Yeah. lawrence had done white plume mountain as a competitive uh, ghost tower of inverness and I guess Dark Tower of Inverness. Yeah, and after a while, we decided, like, no, we wanted to, we, we, we eventually moved it. We just wanted to tell stories and have cool adventures. Yeah. And plus, our our, um, our production schedules increased so much that you couldn't wait to, you know, you, you know, if you're doing a competitive module, there'd be, like, one or two conventions a year. So you could only, yeah. you know, so we needed a lot more other stuff, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. So you um, seem to be when, after the... Holmes Basic, the Moldvay Basic comes out, and then someone goes, "Can you make the expert set?" At this point, I think that's when we're, we're in 1981 now. After these two modules came out in '80, and '81 seems to be the X series is yours. It looks like. Yeah, we were. Um, so when they decided we wanted we wanted to do uh, a new Basic set, the the and Tom had been kind of lobbying hard for that uh, because the home set was good, but it still was there was still it didn't really quite fit fill the role we were hoping for um so we decided yes we want to do D, D a D, D set and then really kind of take it further and then you know expand it in terms of you know we get you past one to four and uh you know take you all the way up into higher levels um so but the thing is it wasn't like Tom went off and started work and then I just came in later. It's like, no, we, we, we planned that right from the start. So Tom and I spent a lot of time kind of just going back and forth about like, well, how, you know, how, you know, how do we set up characters, all this sort of stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, what, and what information needed to be in what book uh, and all that. And uh, Steve Marsh helped out quite a bit with it and uh, on the, expert because there was a lot of work and tom was tom's one of tom's great virtues besides being very creative um is he's he was also uh a, a very fast writer um and so he was able to kind of get through a lot of the basic stuff and you know i i will i will point out my defense that he did have holmes edition to work from a little bit too i had to work i had to work a little bit more on the in the kind of wide open but uh, so because the because of that, he was able to then uh, and they were going to basically use the Palace of Silver Prince, not Palace of Silver Princess and keep uh, keep on the uh, in search of the unknown. Search of the unknown is B1 and then keep on the borderlands. Yeah. Yeah. Keep on the borderlands. Keep on the borderlands so that he didn't have to write a module for it. Um, so he and I then collaborated on doing the uh, the module that would go into the box set for for the expert set, which is how we got Isle of Dread, because we both have a great love of uh, giant monsters, uh, dinosaurs, and old pulpy kind of stuff like that. And so uh, that's that's basically how, and we wanted something that was really gonna show off a lot of like, you know, wilderness kind of activity. We couldn't just give you, here's a map with like, you know, empty borders all around the edges that we, so we said, we'll stick it on an island. Um, and what's better than an island? But you know, King Kong stories <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and dinosaurs. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we, you know, so we shamelessly ripped off Lost Worlds and dinosaurs and and King Kong stuff. And uh, the to make that one work uh, because you got two, we had two writers working on on it and trying not to go mad. Yeah, you and Tom. Uh, we divided the island into the out, outer area and then the center plateau area. Uh, with the idea that the, because it's on this big raised plateau, it could be kind of separate. 
have have kind of a separate identity from everything else all around it. Tom did the the outer island with all the hex crawling, basically, and uh, you know, and lots of tables for dinosaurs that satisfied his passion to put in every dinosaur he could possibly think of. Um, and uh, then I I dealt with the the uh, adventure at the in the center of the uh, island and that part. And we, and we worked out the story with whole Rory Barbarossa getting you there and, you know, and you're you know, following his map and this sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. So, you know, in later years, Gary Hulian, especially, who's a community leader in this on the Cannon Fire um, site and uh, Discord and everything, they absconded this and placed this in Greyhawk specifically in some dr dungeon magazines. And to this day, we just had a Legends and Lore on that. And uh, all yeah. the, uh, this, I mean, this and, uh, and also has Eric a Bona and yeah. Paisel, when they took over the reins of, of Greyhawk and, and then they placed it in a, they made an adventure path that ended with the Isle of Dread. Yeah, yeah. In, in Savage Greyhawk. Tide, so, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. this became honorary. Yeah. Uh, so where, the expert, was it supposed to be Mastara based, Karamikos based, or just gen general? Um, it was kind of a general, because we didn't, we, okay. we, in the expert set, we did the, the known world thing. We mm -hmm. uh, put in um, most, and we didn't. There wasn't a big plan to like turn that into a a full on you know ongoing setting, but we wanted to give you a, hey here here's here's stuff to get you started as a player yeah. that sort of thing, um, and uh, so later on it turned it turned into you know Mistara and all that okay uh, which was you know but one of the things that we ran one of the challenges that we had with with modules was that. In this time period, you'll see a lot of modules that are kind of very vague about where they're set. Mm -hmm. And and then some that are very explicitly set in Greyhawk. Um, and the, the challenge was is that we weren't we weren't really allowed to put anything we wanted, you know, anything we could think of in Greyhawk. If it went into Greyhawk, Gary had to uh, you know explicitly say, yes, this is gonna go in Greyhawk and you know, all that sort of stuff. But the problem was and 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 I think I think the intention was that everything would find it would would be in Greyhawk, but the problem was our our uh, production schedules. You know how much content, how many modules we had to do in a year, was um, more than Gary had time to go through and actually approve for. Yes, this isn't oh. going to be in Greyhawk and that sort of stuff, and so we wound up having to just kind of have a lot of them be kind of vague. And then we started setting them, when we started doing the D&D ones, we started setting them more into that little known world thing that we had put together. So you've yeah. got, uh, for me, you've got uh, Isle of Dread and then the uh, Master of the Desert Nomads and, and Temple of Death are all set within that, that uh, basic expert kind of world. Um, and that world starts to expand. And, and you know, so it, it winds up being this kind of strange, and then we're also perfectly aware that everybody's buying these things and either just playing them and not worrying about where they are or sticking them into their worlds too. In fact, we kind of hope that they're doing that. Yeah. Um, but you wind up with this kind of like craze, you know, uh, these days I would look at it from the marketing aspect and go like, what were we doing? We should have just been, we should have been very, you know, cohesive and organized. Eh, you know, we were young. <laughs> yeah, but was it was it like Gary wanted to to hold on to to Greyhawk and then make something really cool with it later, or was there was that any idea? Well, was Greyhawk, that something, yeah. Greyhawk was his creation, mm -hmm. and it was yeah. his it was this thing that he had you know had where, where things had started. So he was you know um, I, you know I guess understandably somewhat protective yeah. of it, and he wanted to make sure that you know he had. He had the ability to say yes, this belongs in Greyhawk, or I want, you know, or no, I don't want that in, you know, in in the setting. Yeah. Um, but same time, yeah, we, we we had a lot of creative people who were coming up with very crazy ideas, mm -hmm. um, and you know, some of them were good, and you know, some of them were not good, and we didn't do them. <laughs> but but well, so you know, yeah. we just had to find other places to put some of these things. Yeah. So you did two other expert adventures, and I didn't realize this till I just looked at these. These are these. This is a series, the first and second module of the Desert Nomad series X four oh, yeah. and X five. Yeah. And I just realized also that a jugger, there's a juggernaut in X four 
And there's yep. a, and there's a wood. It's wood or stone. So there's different kinds of juggernauts. I did not know that. So there's some neat stuff in these. Um, so uh, was this from your home campaign, or did you um, create this from uh, you know an idea you had? Uh, that came oh, this along? was all created by this point. I was like I'd run out of things to mine from my home campaign, okay. pretty much. Um, and uh, so yeah, this was a um, in part because. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I wanted to, to create a challenge for myself, but to do this kind of caravan adventure across the desert, um, which involved you going through the middle of a war zone and try and make it feel like, you know, you know that you would get involved in some big battles as, uh, but try and have them play out at a role-playing scale as opposed to trying to do giant, you know, giant war game kind of stuff. And so... There were some challenge, you know, some challenges there because hey, if you don't, if you're not doing stuff that makes you kind of go like, "Ooh, I haven't tried that before," um, then it's not fun. And then when they get to Temple of Death, it was then me going going mad with the uh, kind of society stuff there. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so most of your homebrew made it into Dwellers of the Forbidden City. That's kind of where a lot of those ideas went, and then you started creating unique things after that for the yeah, most I mean, part. We had, okay. we had, I mean, I still was running, you know, we were still running campaigns, various of us, but the more, the longer we, the more we worked at TSR, the, the more the, the tendency to have, you know, a long running home campaign started to fall apart on all of so us. Busy. Yeah. 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 Well, because it was like, oh my God, I did this all day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we still play, play test things and, and stuff And then like we'd have to too, play test yeah. and yeah, yeah, we would have to play test things. And then we'd just yeah. get really, we'd get distracted by other really shiny, bad ideas and mm -hmm. want to go try those <laughs> things out. And yeah. We are still a, playing amongst everyone. Was Gary DMing for everyone? Was, uh, or someone no, else? Gary was, Gary was mostly had, yeah, he had maybe a, I, I played in one Gary game invited to his house okay. uh, and uh, you know, he had, he had his, uh, his old players and longtime friends and that sort of stuff. And a lot of us were like, you know, kind of new young folks that, you know, he didn't, he didn't know us that well in many ways. And okay. so, yeah. you know, he, he played, he, if he played, he would tended to play with his group of friends and that was fine. Yeah. You know, I, I can understand that. Yeah. We got a good question uh, back here. Was it different, uh, difficult to to separate between basic D and D and a D and D one that came out, and and to to write for the the different one? What was there to to keep? Oh, and the, mean, yeah. um, the hardest part would wasn't so much the writing because the tones were very different. You could you could easily shift the writing tone, and that would part yeah. was not too bad. But sometimes it was hard to remember. Like, wait. Is that a rule in this game? And then you'd have to go back and look. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And and more often than not, that was when you were working with basic and expert. You'd have to like double check yourself. Like, wait, yeah. how many dice does a fireball get in this one? What are they using? You know, sixes, yeah. eights, or whatever. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because we abandoned D and D and went to a D and D as soon as we got a chance, so to speak. Yeah. And then we, then we. Yeah. we most of us, most of us knew a D and D pretty well. Um, you know, we we could we could cite the page. You know, page. Yeah. And, uh, the but they lived tables. on, f yeah. Yeah, you know, no, where you know, oh yeah, the hit, the two hit tables on such and such page. You know, we just knew. <laughs> yeah, but the, the basic D and D or or the 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 very the Beckmead D and D lived on for for quite some time in it, in in it has surprising. Third one. It has had surprising legs. Yeah. Yeah. So. Absolutely. I actually still use it when I go, when I run convention games. Wow. Because yeah. it is um, way simpler. Mm -hmm. So I don't get bogged down in, you know, rules, details and all this other stuff that I have to like look up in rule books for people. And, uh, and I can just basically get a bunch of people, hey, here's your character, go. Yeah, let's go. We're going to have fun. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it goes, and it goes a lot faster. Yeah. So, uh, Luke just said that you did play, he recalls you playing a Star Frontiers game. Uh, at, at the house, and uh, oh, I know you wrote this, the expanded right. game rules, right, Alpha Dawn? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Star Frontiers had had a kind of a an ugly history. Okay. Um, so when we started, uh, Lawrence and I worked on it, collaborated on this because we uh, TSR wanted to do a science fiction role playing game because yeah. Traveler was out and you know it was it was it was making all it was taking the science fiction market and we said well why are we giving them that market we should be in there right uh, 
And so we started out and with the instruction and the, we wanted something that would compete with Traveler, which is a bit more adult, a little bit more mm -hmm. sophisticated. Yeah. Um, and so we designed Star Frontiers and a lot of what you see in the Star Frontiers that came out is our design. Uh, character classes, the, the, the whole, basically the whole combat system, the numbers, all this sort of stuff. The, the races, came up with the races, all these things. Um, but we had done it with a completely more kind of a, a little bit more serious science, real, and a little bit more, you know, uh, you know, college level science fiction, I guess, would be the you know, kind of a thing. And we finished this, and then we got told, and it was a little bit of a painful thing, that, oh, no, no, that's not what we wanted. What do you mean that's not what we wanted? Well, what, what, what they really were saying was, oh, no, no, we've changed our mind. Oh. Um, that uh, we want, you know, we, we, we need to do something that's going to appeal to 10 year olds. Oh, um, man. Um, so. At that point, instead of saying, go back, rewrite this, you know, and rework it so it'll work, they instead said, oh, we've got to meet a Random House deadline, so we are handing this to, like, three or four other people because, and they're, and they're going to do it, and you guys aren't going to be involved. Wow. That, that was not a happy moment. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wow. So um, how long had you worked on this then? Was it months? Or, or, oh, yeah. Or, yeah. yeah? Work, working on a role-playing game, working out a role-playing game was usually yeah. like, you know, a year's project. Yeah. Of, mm -hmm. You know, between all the planning and then the actual writing would be, you know, yeah. like, the actual writing was like three or four months worth of yeah, writing. Yeah, so you really uh, felt but, like it was your project. Yeah, so we had, we, had yeah. a, we had run, we had run lots of Star Frontiers um, play tests and stuff. And so yeah. that was probably what... Uh, uh, probably what Luke remembers was like running one well, so that, you know, Gary could see what we were doing and have, a, you know, get a sense of the play and everything too. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it came out and, and I can look at it and go like, oh yeah, that's all stuff we came up with. Oh, but they changed that and they changed the kind of the, the focus of the game. Um, but, you know, it's still a lot of people like it, so I'm yeah. not going to complain too much. Yeah. Could, could you die in character creation? In, in, like in Traveler. <laughs> no, no, no. We didn't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's so funny. I almost feel sorry for, for, for the, the, the Mark when, when, or when, he, when he, I saw him at Game Hall Con, and one of the first questions he got was, oh, God, like, oh I had a character so that died in, in yeah. So, so that became a, a kind of a hallmark of, of the Traveler yeah. RPG. So, the I think day. the biggest, the, one of the biggest changes is, is they decided they wanted to do it much more of a good versus evil kind of a thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, the uh, the evil worm guys that are in uh, Star Frontiers now, those were actually one of the playable races you could be in mm -hmm. um, in in the version that we did because there was no evil hostile you know alien race to everybody. Uh, there were you know there were a lot of like you know you know competitive you know. Yeah. You know, I think the worm guys were pretty amoral about stuff, but <laughs> but uh, so that was like one of the biggest challenge changes that had happened because yeah. ours was going to be more about you know discovering dealing with weird societies and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Luke says it was so much. Uh, it was great with Zeb as the GM. It was uh, it was the play test so much fun. He just said in chat. So that's that's pretty. Yeah. Cool. Oh, well, thank you, Luke. Yeah, it was. <laughs> That's I awesome. honestly don't remember this at all. <laughs> well, that's cool. <laughs> no, but it's like, I mean, it's so much if someone life, asked me what I did <laughs> yeah, 45 years ago at it worked then yeah. or 30, 30 something years, then then you yeah, it's hard to remember. Here's a here's a question uh from this era. Did you get to choose your artists or were they assigned or did um did you say, Hey, I I'd, I'd want to work with this person when you were writing? Uh, you could lobby for artists, but at that point we the artists were all a pool okay. essentially. And so a lot of a lot of the art was dependent on who had time in their schedules because you know we had a lot of things we had a lot of things going through. Yeah, they were doing art for Dragon Magazine. They were doing you know right. so so it would be like okay this thing's coming in who 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 the art director would figure out who's got time and who's got and the artists would kind of sometimes lobby for things that they really wanted to work on. Yeah. And so you know it's a, it was a little bit of a luck of the draw, and sometimes you got some really great results out of it. Yeah. So here's another now my buddy tim the ever mysterious tim everyone knows him this is one I, you wrote one of his favorite basic adventures of all time the radus right Carthor radu veiled society 
Oh my God, the Veiled Society. He loves it. I played this with him. I think when he's I was... the only person who's ever told me they love it. Oh, he loves this adventure. <laughs> loves it. Right, Tim? Uh, so, And there's three different factions, which made it cool. It's kind of pre Greyhawk with all the infighting going on, you know, Greyhawk City, because there's no Free City Greyhawk box set out at this time. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was definitely, it was definitely the goal was to do a, do an adventure that wasn't like, hey, let's go off and, you know, slaughter some, uh, some guys out in the wilderness. Or, intrigue. You know, go intrigue. And, but it was meant to be all about much more of the intrigue and the kind of the, the grand Shakespearean kind of a thing. Um, and I discovered from doing it, that is really hard to write yep. and really hard to kind of put together so that players don't, so that, and because no matter what I do, I know players are going to take it off the rails at some point. It's just all the wheels are going to fall off and it's going to go off in some weird direction. And was trying to figure out how to give a poor referee at least enough to work with so that, you know, when, when that happens, they've got, you know, some direction they could try, they could try and steer it in. <laughs> was this your first attempt at like city intrigue role, uh, playing? Because I, I can imagine it was. You know, it, yeah, it had yeah, its this, challenges. This was this was yeah. the first time I really tried to do this in a in a certainly in a big way in a written any kind of a written project. Cool. Um, well, uh, you know, I, I remember. Gave up. I keep still trying to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I don't know what I think this came out eighty three. 8283, and I remember when I was in high school, Tim running this for me, and and he just, it was just, it was cool. It was different. It was one of those different games, kind of like, um, you know, you remember the different ones. Ravenloft was different, you know, and uh, uh, Ghost Tower of Inverness was different, and you just remember those different adventures. So this is a hidden gem for any of those who like, you could put it in a city somewhere in Greyhawk, too. Uh, you know, any city you could have these different factions. Oh, yeah, I mean, come know. on. It's got veiled yeah. cultists. How can you? How can I go wrong? Yeah, definitely yeah. <laughs> definitely was an excellent one. I just wanted to mention, I know Tim's on, and, uh, you know, Tim comes on the shows a lot, DMs on the channel, and he is, uh, you know, he's a, uh, really was excited about that you had written that one. Um, so if we go one year ahead, then you get into this. I, I got to hear this story. How you guys got this license and you wrote this, <laughs> Conan Unchained. Well, the Conan movies were out, right? Uh, yeah, had come out, yeah. and you know we were all big Conan fans. I mean, mm -hmm. most of us were because, hey, you know, when in in the sixties and seventies, when you grew up on fantasy, that meant you would you definitely grew up in some amount on reading Conan stories because there it's wasn't 84. a whole lot else in reprint and that sort of stuff. Uh, so. Um, so basically, uh, we got offered the movie to do the movie license thing, and uh, I really liked Conan. You know, I was pretty familiar with it, having read a lot of it, and so was was happy to do it. The trick was, you know, to try and figure out how to do an adventure with Conan, uh, and have the other characters that are not Conan have any kind of meaningful role. Yeah, <laughs> super tie. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise you wind up with uh, some terrible examples, which I'm sure we'll get to later on when we talk about another project. <laughs> yeah, but the first movie, Conan didn't have a party, so to speak. In the later movies, he actually had a party going with him. So, so yeah. well, he had Supatai, and then he had uh, Mako yeah. as the yeah, wizard. Yeah, but they were they, they and, were uh, Valeria. insignificant sidekicks in, in some way. Yeah, had a lot of significant sidekicks. Yeah, yeah, but certainly no. Yeah. yeah, and that's the problem with like like Conan. You know, you can't have. The minute you have like somebody who's equal of Conan, then Conan's not all that, you know, like really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but so the the challenge, so the challenge was how to do that, and part of it was, I, if I remember right, and I could be remembering wrong, is nobody played Conan in this. Ah, okay. Yeah. But basically, Conan is an NPC character, and in fact, you're involved in rescuing him at one point because Conan would frequently get himself into oh know, yeah messes that he needed mm -hmm. to be saved from. But yeah. Um, and uh, so, so you were you were kind of doing things, either kind of following in his path or or uh, that sort of stuff, so that it, you know, basically you could still feel like you were the heroes of the story that you were involved in, as opposed to, uh, you know, oh, there's Conan and then there's all the rest of us. So JB, who's the artist JB? Who did the Jim artwork? Butler? Okay. Jim Butler. That would be. If you hold up the picture, I can probably tell for sure. Yeah, that's Jim Butler. Okay, he did all the Conan uh, artwork in yeah. here then. Okay, okay. I was just curious because you have uh, Conan, uh, Nestor, Juma, uh, and Valeria's in here. 
Yeah, that Larry was me. The... That was me rating the stories in the books a lot. You know. Okay. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, and I know there was a second one that came out uh, right uh, after this one, uh, and that, yeah. but you did not write that one. Uh... No, I didn't do that okay. one. That was done by. Uh, I think that was done by Ann. It's a. It's. Yeah. So, uh, Brown, I think did that one. How long did they have? The, was it was it a limited license on the Conan that you did? Yeah, I mean, okay. with with something like that, that we had the license for a couple of years, um, long enough for me to do a Conan role playing game, okay. um, and uh, okay. then we, I, you know, with with most kinds of arrangements like that, you have the license for a number of years. You usually have an option to renew that license if you know. Um, and there's an also usually clauses that if you haven't done anything after a certain period, uh, then it reverts back to the uh, to the uh, license holder, so they can go off and peddle okay. it someplace else. Yeah. And you know, Conan did you know did didn't it didn't do amazing business, so there was not a big press to to, to renew the license on TSR's part. Okay. They're worth a pretty penny now, though. Let me tell you. <laughs> it's crazy what it's crazy what is worth a lot of money now. Those Conan adventures yeah. are worth a ton uh, in good condition. It's just nuts wow. how stuff is selling. It, it, yeah, absolutely. It's um, my retirement money tucked away in a box <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should dig into it. Oh, my gosh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Um, we're running down through the end of the first edition era, and I have one more um, – one and uh the, i think i think we've covered everything but this uh and before we get into second edition so i have there's a question in the audience you may want to answer this for later too but during this era was there anything that you really would have loved to participate in during first edition that you that you, uh, you just didn't have time for or that someone else did and uh, um you keep on eating that cake man it's your birthday you yeah, enjoy well, it you know I enjoy it you know. Yeah, yeah enjoy it, please. Facing it out, I'm, you know. <laughs> um, there were so many things that were going on that uh, you. It, at times, it was hard to like, you know, wow, that do I want to be involved in that, or, uh, or sometimes like I deliberately chose not to be involved in Dragonlance, and that was probably a stupid idea, stupid, stupid thing. But, okay. Um, Dragonlance. What was the the, the uh, Dragonlance rationale behind? Up. What was mm -hmm. your rationale behind Dragon? Um, in in Dragon part Lance? because it already had um, uh, Tracy and Margaret as very much kind of strong creators and this yeah. sort of stuff. And I figured that if I were to go in, I would just like get either, you know, keep trying to do something they wouldn't want to do or I'd get grumpy because. And so I just figured, yeah. you know, there's, there's enough people in there yeah. dealing with it mm -hmm. that, uh, that it was not. It was, you know, not for me to go jumping in and try and do stuff. But and I then once, and then once, you know, they had done it, then it was like, oh, well, that's basically their concept, and it's, and it's a very kind of a strict, it's a, you know, it's a very defined world, and it had defined boundaries on what you could do. And yeah. at that point, once it was defined, it was like, hey, I don't really know if I wanted to do, it, you know, kind of stay with it. I'm not sure. I wasn't sure if I could stay within the lines. <laughs> Right. Yeah. But you do have a publication during second edition that I found for Dragonlance. So you did do something for oh, it. Oh, yes. I did do one thing for yeah, it. Yeah, you yes. did. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But let's... And, it's, and, it, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a trend you see in the box sets. That yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to end up first edition... We have this. I still have the Toys R Us ten dollar ninety seven cent sticker on this one, and that oh is oh my god, <laughs> there it is, Oriental, Oriental Adventures. Yeah. That was a huge wow. thing when it came out. Yeah, was, yeah. And yeah have, that was the first book that wasn't introduction explicitly. Uh, even though Gary's name is on the cover of this, uh, it was not the first book that he was not explicitly like you know writing or involved mm -hmm. uh, yeah. he was involved in it because i would check i would i was running all this stuff through him i'd meet with him regularly about what i was doing but it was pretty much uh yeah you know, my my design you know stuff and everything uh his name is on it because that was the that what was in the random house catalog and so that's what what the name was going to be on the on the cover yeah um and it was also they felt that uh, because this was the first hardback that would have not had his name on it. They weren't sure if that was a good idea, and so they they said, "Nope, his name's going on it." Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, I can, you can only protest so much. Zeb, I'm going to write. I'm going to read the last paragraph of your introduction. 
if you don't mind. And it, and, and it goes like this. Finally, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to write this introduction for a personal reason. This is the last part of the book to be written. With these chosen closing words, I have finished an exciting, challenging, and sometimes nerve-wracking project. Take it and discover the lands of mystery contained inside. Wahoo! September 17th, Wahoo. 1985, David Zip Cook. Very yeah. cool. <laughs> Yeah, it was a nerve-wracking project. Okay. Yeah. Um, originally, it was supposed to have been, the, the plan was uh, that it was going to be done by a different writer, a different designer writer, not, not a staff one, but somebody that uh, uh, Gary had worked with or knew, I'm never quite sure, I wasn't quite sure what. Um, it quickly, went, it, not quickly, unfortunately, it became apparent that he didn't have the capability to do it uh wasn't couldn't generate the volume of material you needed we, you needed just the volume of text and the the design stuff was was not that great um so i had been kind of lobbying before that because we those of us in house who kind of said yeah this guy has never done any kind of a major project and we were all very dubious that it would work, that it would happen. And we were, you know, unfortunately in that sense, we were right. Um, and so uh, I had been kind of prepping and lobbying for the, you know, somebody's gonna have to kind of step in and help out or whatever. So the end result was they finally said, okay, yeah, we need to, we need to get this serious and get this done. We need to get, we, and that meant basically throwing out everything and starting over. Um, there wasn't much to throw out, um, but they had a schedule with Random House. It had been, you know, it was on Random House's uh, release schedule. They had been, it had been sold to Random House, so it had to come out on that date, which meant that I had about three months to write, to design and write the whole book. Wow. Um, and, 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 and we had, you know. <laughs> And, and, and that included developing it. all the the, the 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 mechanics, game oh mechanics, yes. classes, yes. and all Pretty that. Pretty much too. meant doing almost oh, all of that. Wow. For, so not fortunately, only... like I said, I had been prepping up for some of this in advance, yeah. right? But uh, but it did mean I spent a lot of very late nights. I uh, <laughs> basically got got them to clear almost everything else. Originally, I was also supposed to be working on other stuff and then do this on the side. Because this was being done as a separate contract, which is not something that TSR normally do, did, uh, but eventually got them to say, "No, look, if we want to see this, you want this thing to see the light of day on time, um, yeah, I just have to be allowed to just get it done." Uh, I was working, you know, six days a week until midnight every night, kind of a thing. Um, wow. For a while, I was working doing. Uh, doing regular work during the day and then coming back after dinner because we live close to the office and working until midnight on on this mm -hmm. uh, and that for a period like you know seven days a week um, so yeah it was very stressful I was uh, I was pretty burnt well, by the time I got it done yeah. but we got it done we made yeah. we made our deadline and that was what that was the big thing that mattered Jim Ward told us the same story about Greyhawk Adventures he had three months <laughs> to get yeah, that yeah. book together. And it's very impressive you both got it done, which is really yeah. cool. So I, I know there's a lot of, um, you know, for its time, for its time, there was no there was no issues with calling it Oriental Adventures and all that. And, you know, that's crept into society now. But there, there's some classes in here that are like, you know, we have the Kensai and the Samurai. And, yep. I, 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 you know, it's it, it's just, it's a, it's a really great feel to it. And, uh, you know, this is, one of the last, I guess this is one of the last first edition publications that came out before you took the jump in the second, which is a lot. I mean, this is you, right? I, yeah, you, well, yeah. This so is... we, had, we, had a, we had a whole series then, then of, uh, there's like the Dungeon Survival Guy, the Wilderness yeah, the Survival wilderness. Guy. Yeah, that's and, true. Uh, you, and yeah. Manual of the Plains was, was Manual of the, the Plains, latest, yeah. yeah. Because basically what, it, what that, what Oriental did is it established the idea that, hey, we need a, we need a, because Unearthed Arcana had come out. And then there was kind of a long gap and they said, oh, we need another hardback. And they said, oh, and we did Oriental Adventures and it sold well. And they said, oh, we need to do a hardback a year. Yeah. <laughs> and the only way, and, and then on top of that, because I had gotten this as a separate contract, that became kind of a bargaining point for the other uh, other designer, staff designers who were going like, hey, 
wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, you can earn extra. I want to earn some extra bucks too. Yeah, so every, so that's why, you know, we had, you know, like Doug Niles did one, Jeff Grubb did one, you know, this yeah. sort of thing. Um, you know, Jim Ward did one. Um, because, you know, it was a, here, here, is, here is a project you can do that, you know, we'll, and we will treat them as separate uh, and, uh, and we'll get the hardback year thing until, of course, we eventually glutted the market with hardbacks. Yeah, but I love those books that the, the, that, that came out late, first edition, that when the Wilderness and the, the Dungeon Year Survival Manual of the Plains Oriental, they, they, were, they added so much interesting new stuff to the game, so to speak. They expanded the scope of the game. In, in, mm -hmm. in, in they did, they, they certainly did. And some, I mean, yeah. there, there were a bunch of things. I mean, Oriental Adventures, I'm not, I'm not sure all of, I mean, I'm not sure all the classes worked as well as they could, but there are other things I, you know, like the proficiency system that we, exactly. that we introduced there. Yep. Mm -hmm. That expanded. I wish, the, the one thing that didn't get picked up on, I do kind of wish, which was the armor class by by arm by part system? I was always oh. seen like instead of just saying, "Oh, I've got plate mail," instead you say, "Oh, I've got you know I've got these plate shoulders and I've got you know some chain leggings," and then yeah. you just added up all the value of that, and that was what the armor class was. Yeah. Um, um, so that you could have we we could have done much more you know piecemeal kinds of things. Yeah. But you know didn't didn't go. Um, wh when was that proposed? Oh, it's, it's in the it's in the rules. It, yeah, it's okay. in the Oriental Adventures. Yeah, it's in the Oriental Adventures, Adventures, but yeah. it just never it never caught on from from okay. there. Yeah. yeah, but it was a lot that 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 what that book kind of advanced the game. I, and and the funny thing is that cool. I love the book, but I never used Oriental because I, I played in Greyhawk, so I never used the <laughs> Oriental flair. But it was a very interesting book from from a game mechanic standpoint, and 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 the the depth and the scope of it that was that was new to me, so to speak. It it went. Beyond any uh, any publication that I've, any AD and D or D and D book I read before then, and then came the wilderness and and the the um, the, the, the the dungeon near survival guides that I and me being in kind of over, loving my overland adventures, I love the wilderness survival <laughs> guide it was fantastic and manual of the plains also was like wow we there have been multiverse to play it so yeah so, so manual of the plains was a great great challenge for Jeff. <laughs> It's yeah, I, I talked to him about it like a couple of years ago. I had had a chance with Wolfgang Bauer and Jeff Grubb and me and, and we talked about it. And, and and I also asked him like the, all the some of the, the modules that ended up in Greyhawk. I said, we shoehorned in them, so to yeah. speak. He said so. <laughs> so. Yeah, that was that was kind of yeah, things happened. But we're getting multiple questions on Caratour itself. Was it meant for Greyhawk and it ended up in Forgotten Realms or was it? No, it was, uh, it was it was never meant for Greyhawk because okay. by this point there was pretty much almost an absolute hands-off policy on Greyhawk. Okay. Um, we had, um, you know, we had we had the Greyhawk world setting. We had the little you know the little map set stuff, um, but something like Caratour uh, would have yeah that would have needed way way a lot more and a lot more approval. Um, it was it was. Intended eventually, yeah, to, to become. I don't know if it was intended when I first created it because you know you have to create something just just so I can have a place to kind of do all this. But when, yeah. then we decided, yeah, we needed to kind of put it somewhere. So we we uh, basically did that in the horde and added them to because uh, it made a kind of a nice flow for, for uh, uh, Forgotten Realms. And Jeff then realized. Yeah, Jeff gave me grief because uh, when you take when you take the horde and all that territory of Horde and Caratour. Forgotten Realms is this tiny little part of this giant. And meanwhile, you right. know, Caratour is like three times larger. And yeah. he was going, he was going like, you know, <laughs> that I managed to like in one fell stroke own more of the Forgotten Realms. Yep, yep. That's um, good. That's good. I kept pointing out, but yeah, look, yeah. look at Asia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking when Gary left the company or was ousted, or, or but, but let's don't go into that discussion. Yeah. I'm more kind of keen on, on did that change the dynamic? I mean, if Forgotten Realms came in the forefront and stuff, was that part of of, of meaning Greyhawk? It did, was it did change, it did change yeah. the it did change the dynamic because yeah. um, uh, when Gary was there and and you know basically and and was actively involved and his, his level of being involved very big, depending on like all the other things that were going on. Yeah. Um, you know, then, you know, basically you were, you were working to make sure that, you know, you were working to try and not to, to please him, but to make sure that you were working with stuff that would, would fit 
in the you know, yeah. some stuff. He was the final um, arbitrator. And he was a fine. Yeah. He was he was in many ways could be the final arbiter. And a lot of things he didn't. He just like yeah, yeah. that sounds good. Go do it. Right. Um, but um, uh, when, once he once he left, in, or I think one even when he was out on the west coast, um, they didn't have anybody kind of at the top who was really kind of a creative directory kind of kind of personality. Yeah. Um, and so that that fell down onto uh, the design department. It's like they, the, the management at that point would be like, okay, this is what this is the stuff we need to do. These are these are the buckets we need to fill. Right. <laughs> I mean one hardback we need an yeah, yeah, module sort of, and stuff you know, like we, that. we need yeah. we need X number of modules. We mm -hmm. need to you know, these are the yeah. buckets we need to fill. You guys go propose and and come up with proposals and, and a plan. You know, they would then look at it and like, okay, yeah, that sounds good. But yeah. mo mostly it meant that the kind of figuring out creatively what we were doing fell on the designers, which led to us going like, you know, for us, it was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we can do whatever. Yeah. Well, we couldn't do whatever we want. Because no, but, we had, but a know, lot of, yeah, it was more creative freedom than you but had, we had But we had maybe. a lot more freedom to say yeah, to, about yeah. what we wanted to do. And, you know, we had a lot of interesting ideas and some bad ones. Yeah. And, oh, and, um, yeah. And so... So it was it was for 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 the people for the design department it was kind of an exciting time because we could come up with an idea and we could really lobby for it and pitch it yeah. and and you know see it through. Um, it did mean sometimes that we then actually had to do them. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing when you propose something you you end up doing it. That's the yeah. golden rule. If you're the one proposing it, then then you have to be prepared to do it. So yeah. All right. So. When you get to this point and second edition comes out, some there's some basic changes to the game system. Where were you the architect of like we're gonna go to spheres with mages and clerics and druids, or was that a joint a decision? Uh, it you know? was it was both. Okay. Uh, in so first off, none of this happened because I woke up and said, Yeah, I want to rewrite A D and D. That okay. was not no. That was not the goal. That was not the original plan. The original plan was more from uh, Steve Winter and the editorial side okay. of saying we need to turn these the uh, the A D and D the D and D book the A D and D books into uh, something that is more usable. Gary's right. You know, the, Gary's stuff is really interesting, but the organization is often very you know, kind of random and chaotic. And, and we had learned a lot more about maybe how to better present and how to put together like, oh yeah, we should have all the, all this information in, in, you know, here as opposed to scattered across, you know, two okay. books yeah. in different spots. The old DMG was not the best of organization. Yeah. Literally, yeah. as Steve Winter likes to say, he literally got copies of the books at one point to kind of, to kind of make his case and uh, cut them apart line by line at wow. times and and to reorganize them into how this and so you know he had to like go through multiple copies of the books to get us all done right um yeah and then you know literally doing paste up to to do these kind of you know pages of how it would all be organized and then it's a realize yeah we just need to kind of like really you know rewrite you know redo the whole thing so at that point and the idea, Gary had even talked about the idea in print and stuff about that there needed to be a new edition at some point. Um, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure it was his intention that he was he was going to do that. Never got around to it. And then circumstances changed. But now we know then the, but the, the thought that we needed a new edition didn't go away. And so uh, I was a you know, the most senior designer we had there at the time and uh had worked a lot with gary on other stuff and uh so i think some of the people who kind of have been um had a good understanding of like what gary intended for dnd like skip uh and uh, uh some other people who had worked a lot with gary on you know various just you know what what his vision of the game knew that i knew that I was kind of, you know, more or less in that, you know, not going to do horrible things to it. Um, so uh, basically, we eventually decided, yes, we needed to do this. Um, then it became then, well, how do you do this? So they took me and Steve and John Pickens, 
and literally moved us separate from the rest of the design department. Um, and we would sit and figure out kind of like, well, you know, we would go through all the sections, try and figure out a what a what belonged in which book, those sort of things. And then really started looking at like, well, how do we how do we bring in a lot of the stuff that's in the previous books? What do we want to bring in? What do we what do we think is maybe not such a great idea that we, you know, we can kind of quietly forget about um, and a few things that I can spectacularly kill. Um, <laughs> but uh, but um, but basically and looked at what are the thing what are what are the ways that the players were actually playing the game from our from our experience and knowledge uh and what can we do there so then and things like schools of magic and stuff then came about well we want to we want to kind of get these down to kind of like this idea of you have core classes but then we have all these crazy subclasses and how do we get them you know kind of working happily in this system you know so we had the illusionists and so the I mean, looking at the illusionists is like oh that leads to the idea that, hey, you could take magic and you can kind of divide it up into all. Because we had that information. If you actually look in the old yeah. mm -hmm. AD&D books, it said like, oh, this was, you know, what school this was, right? Yeah. So let's start actually using that information and use it so that you could create, you know, oh, I want to be a magician of such and such school, that sort of stuff. And once I did schools of magic that way, then it was like, oh, well, we got clerics and we got, you know, druids and we have yeah we can kind of apply the same principle different you know different form but same principle there uh the hardest one was to try and figure out how to get like the bard and the thieves and all the those to work because they were um very you know they're they, they had less commonality yeah. um and right. so you know trying to look for for the things that kind of bind all those together into kind of one thing um so and then there are a couple of classes that you know they just didn't didn't feel like they belong bard <laughs> uh the bard was a tough one it yeah it's tough yeah, yeah uh the uh the the monk because yeah you know that's a that's very much you know having done oriental adventures we had a home for the monk yeah um mm -hmm. and uh whereas uh ad and d was always much more of a kind of a western european kind of a thing so the monk didn't really feel what, and then I just had uh, philosophical arguments about the the assassin, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and in the sense that you don't, you know, first off, having it as a table, you know, it's a led, percentage led that, to so many disastrous yeah. results. In oh, sure, yeah, sure, it did. Yeah, um, yeah it's it's yeah, that, that's why it, it's much more of a mindset. You know, if I'm going mm -hmm. to assassinate somebody, well, I just you know, I can be anybody and go assassinate somebody. Yeah, uh, and. And the barbarian was a bad case of kind of a bad case of power leveling, mm -hmm. uh, and you know needed to be kind of you know restrained. Yeah. But it was it was a fun class, but it was kind of going overboard a little bit. But fun. Yeah. And, so yeah. so try it was a lot, some of it was trying to bring all because this is the thing that happens with every every edition is the later expansions start just start doing layering on more and more. And you know, and you feel like, oh, I have to have something that's even more impressive than the last thing we did. Yeah. And the next thing you know, it's like, yeah, you know, hi, I'm the guy who can swing my sword and you know, kill three, 13 people all around me all at once. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so, so I got a, uh, I got a good audience question, and I got a bunch of my own. So here's the audience question: <laughs> Did you ever consider going to that uh, ascending instead of descending uh, FACO system? Into, yes. Yeah. But, yes, we absolutely did. Okay. And in fact, it was one of the first things that we thought about in the combat system. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, yeah. can we, why don't we just have armor class start at one or, yeah. or you know, zero yeah. for no armor and then go up, right? right. Um, and then we could do, yeah, then we could do this all by, you know, high die rolls and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we, uh, basically, we, we kind of, we pitched it, uh, but the problem was we have a lot of first edition product out and they didn't want to and they were and they were going to be putting first edition product out right up until about the time that the second edition came out um and they didn't want to do something that basically would make that that con that product unplayable okay so um and that was and so that became actually one of the things we had to, we had to make sure that you know if you're reasonably clever you know, and, or not even reasonably clever, but, you, know, <laughs> you know, that you could take a first edition game and you could fairly easily incorporate it into a second edition Easily. Game. 
so that, yeah, we really did say, yeah, you know, it would make a whole lot more sense and we could do everything, you know, we could do our saving throws yeah. and all this sort mm -hmm. of stuff that way. Um, but that would have meant that all of that first edition product that was out there would have become much more incomprehensible and harder to convert for players. And we didn't want to do that. I still use Thacko to this day. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, we, so that... we came up with a fact. So Steve came up with a Thacko concept, and, okay. you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, here's some questions for you for second edition. Whose idea was it for thieves to assign points instead of have a table? Uh, that was my idea. It does make it kind of cumbersome and slow. <laughs> I like it. We have our... Yeah, it gives, it gives yeah. you a great, great yeah. amount of uh, customization. But boy, yeah. it is kind of like, oh, I need a, I need it as an NPC. I need a thief that's, you know... So, so we allow straight thieves, not multi-classers, to do it. It's just like with weapon specialization, so there you go. So you have to be just a thief class in order to access cho choice of max per points and all. And it works very well. Two, this book. One of my favorites of all time that you wrote. And it's along with Finley, Herring, Kubasik, Sergeant, and Swan. So you got a yeah, huge ten, boat. 10 billion people, yes. <laughs> Two of my favorite all-time classes are in this book. Who is responsible for the Wild Mage? Uh, that was me. Beautiful. Love it. Love the concept. The Elementalist. I'm not exactly sure who did that one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that book has so many authors because basically a lot of the, a lot of the kind of like just the, the spells and the magic and that sort of stuff, we basically uh, uh, brought in a bunch of freelancers to generate a lot of that because, again, we needed it really fast. Um, as okay. always, and uh, and you know, so I I was kind of the the uh, wrangler for a lot of it, and so wrote the wrote the wild magic stuff and kind of established uh, it's, I, of it, it's just yeah. there's even a uh, Deb. I don't know if you know, but there's a great net book of wild magic out there that someone yeah. made. You know how they have all these great, great, great net books. Great ways there's... to stupidly kill yourself. <laughs> exactly, yeah. but it is it is so fantastically spectacular yeah, of some of the crazy with fumble built into the mechanics. Yeah, system. it is. It's wonderful. <laughs> That's the first and, and again and awesome. But... Someone made a miracle of the chaotic. The, the zapper guy yeah. from the dungeon masters guy into a wild mage. I think he's in the apocalypse stone, and he's a wild mage, and it's just it's brilliant. I, I, you know, this table is crazy. You know, with all the effects on it. Yep. But, yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Yep. You know how you know that it's loved. So when Beam Dog redid Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate Two, they added in a wild mage Nera into that didn't exist in the original Baldur's Gates, and they put the wild mage class in there. So you know that's how much that's why that it was loved. And I was like, this is yep. brilliant. So wow, Beam Dog really set themselves up a challenge then. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. To do that with all the the surge and stuff. So I'm 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 so happy to hear that you created that class. Oh, one, of, one of my favorites. Yep. One of my favorites of all time. Very, very cool. Uh, so, what was over? Was were they happy overall with second edition? Like, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, they didn't fire me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was Paladin uh, Health. Thank you, for sure. Yeah. yeah. At the time, at the time, yes, it Thank was. That, I mean, we sold. We sold. You know, there's endless arguments about how much was sold, and I know that uh, John Peterson has actually managed to dig out some fairly good numbers, and you know, but. At the time, it did. It was. It did what it needed to do there, which was kind of lift, lift our the the sagging sales that we had. Did it? Yeah. It okay. did not lift them. You know, obviously, it didn't lift them as much as uh, they they ultimately would have loved. But you know. Yeah. But it, it was a good, solid step forward when it came out, and because yeah, I, it I mean, was it, a huge release, and and I remember it was so awesome to get the new books and stuff. That was yeah. And, yeah. And, but the, you know, the problem is, is that you know when you're selling like a, you can sell a lot of players' handbooks, but you can't sell ne nearly as many Dungeon Masters guys. Exactly, and, so like only yeah. one in ten or yeah. one in five or something and like that. So, yeah. you know, it's it's just a challenge on these things, which is why you know we always tended to to do more things that were player. Uh, facing player oriented, uh, yeah. Because yeah, you know there were more players than dungeon masters. So, um, okay. One, so, one thing that was new. Oh, I was going to ask about that one. The, the monsters. Yeah, yeah. The, with the leaf, meaning, loose who leaf. came up with the idea? Because at first, I loved the idea of having sheets. Yeah, that was. Put uh, in a we binder. thought that we thought we were so clever about that. And we didn't yeah. think that through carefully. <laughs> exactly. And then after a while, I was like, no. That then I started hating yeah, it after yeah, after that, a while. Yeah, so that, was, speak, that was so. a big mistake and on our okay. part. Yeah. But once again, to get original copies of these is almost impossible. All the different sub ones, the Greyhawk one yeah. especially, is 
very hard to get a hold of. So, um, yeah, and I hated that some of them were printed yeah. on the back. And, and if I yeah. win one yeah, sheet I mean, for each talking, monster, oh, wait, yeah. would have been perfect. And then there would be souls These you could just buy had more you binders for, would have been fantastic. The ones so, that had yeah. you doing main the main creatures in were these two yeah. that I, I, I found mm -hmm. up on all the Forgotten Realms Appendix. But, you know, um, you were doing a lot of, uh, and someone asked this question, you were doing a lot of miscellaneous, you, you, you delved into all the systems. So here's the, uh, at this time frame, here is the Dragonlance. The only Lance, one that I didn't actually do something for was Gamma World. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Here's your Dragonlance submission, oh, yes, Time of the yes. Dragon. Some of the best it, Where I blew covers. up the other side of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's one of the best covers. I love that cover. It's, it's, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, it had the, one of the things I loved about this one is the, the art on the cover yeah. and the mm -hmm. art on the, on the booklets inside is so amazingly good. Fred Fields yeah. has got some a great piece. And, uh, um, and there, I mean, yeah, it was... We need to do, let's do, I was not the one who said, yeah, we should do the other side of the planet. This was not my idea. Uh, but it was one of those ones that you get handed and say, hey, you know, we, let's, we want to do a box set of the other, you know, of the rest of the world. And I'm going, but, but our, the whole story is all about what happens on that one continent. And, you know, the rest of the world doesn't even exist as far as all that is concerned. You know, what kind of, you know, what can you possibly do? Um, and because you can't, you can't just retrofit it all into the Dragonlance, you know, the big Dragonlance story arc, because it wouldn't make sense um, to have the, you know, suddenly now they have to go over here. And we didn't tell you about that part and we did the books, you know. Um, so, so the only thing I could think about is, well, if you're living on the other side of the planet, right, and suddenly you know, this giant comet, whatever, Lance of God, whatever you want to call it, like destroy, you know, strikes and shatters the world and does all these things that are kind of very dragon lance -y, right? <laughs> well, what the hell do you think is going on on your side of the world? <laughs> right, right. Um, and so basically it was just an, then, then just tried to make it as interesting as possible um, without really referencing much about what was going on on the Dragonlance side of the world because, you know, they are seeing only the reactions like all the dragons or that they all, you know, disappear, they come back, all this sort of stuff. Um, and, you know, I got, got some good things out of it, but, you know, like the, the, uh, the Minotaurs turned out to be fairly popular. Uh, so that was cool because I got to do Roman Legion Minotaurs. Um, nice. So... You also start delving into writing at this time, and I think this book, Horse Lords, comes out before the Horde comes out. Am I correct on this? Yeah, Horse Lords was written before the Horde comes out. Okay. Then we, then we do the Horde book. Okay. The Horde box set. All right. Yeah. So, um, and that was the one where we basically it's part of a trilogy where each book was written by a different writer. Okay. But the way we kind of justify that is each book takes place in a different part of the Forgotten Realms completely with a different set of characters. Oh, okay. But it tells kind of an overwhelming, an overall arc of events that occur um, between them. So Horse Sword starts in the in the center part, in the step, and then the second book, I think it's Dragon Wall, I think it's called, um, uh, which Troy Denning wrote. Uh, takes place in uh, Caratur, and then the last one, the conclusion, takes place in the Forgotten Realms proper. Okay. Um, and it, and the whole Horde set comprises these three books, really, for the most part. Is that was that the whole idea behind it? Yeah, there okay. was. There was okay. We were never really planning on doing like you know. Wow, a lot of people want to play Mongolian horse uh, modules. You know? Right. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, but it was it was again to to kind of you know expand the forgotten realms you know get to try and then you know get character i'm going to ask a bizarre question here maybe not but what did ed greenwood think of it ed greenwood is an amazingly um accommodating guy okay uh, in that he he knows you know he knows that uh once tsr got its hands on forgotten realms you know with his you know that it really wasn't his anymore it was basically uh and so 
he was he was never one to say like oh my god you did you know you're he would he would at times go like you're doing what but he wouldn't <laughs> like he wouldn't get like you know irate about it or anything like that um and instead he would then try he would then provide you with as much information as he could you know um because yeah he he was aware that you know, this was had long since no was no longer the campaign that he was running this was yeah. now um and, but and and as he points out is that you know he, it gave him the opportunity to do a lot of things, you know, with TSR that he wouldn't have had otherwise. And so, you know, he's, yeah. he was always pretty good about it. He's, we had him on a couple weeks ago for the second time. He's such a great guy. And he's actually playing. Yeah, for, he's, 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 he's a personality. <laughs> I'm yeah. DMing for him next Saturday in Greyhawk. And I'm, I'm just so excited. And with Anna playing yeah. and, uh, and Tony Winslow Brill and Eric Mengi, I can't wait. I can't wait to play in that game. Yeah. I am so excited. He's a great guy. And and, uh, and Eric Boyd, I'm not sure if he did any work with Eric, but Eric's uh, as well. So very very cool. I, I you know I, you you were. It seems like in second edition, um, Zeb, you were you got a lot going on. Like I found this. Uh, so you were in Dark Sun, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. One of my favorite modules is Vecna Lives. <laughs> oh, oh, Vecna Lives. Yeah, let's go to Vecna awesome. Lives. That's what let's I was go. laughing yeah. about. Oh yeah, let's go to Vecna Lives yeah. because yeah. um <laughs> because all right, uh, let's yeah. do it. Let's it do comes. it. Yep. So at the beginning you go you're going to play the Circle of Eight, but I'm going to kill them all off, which was yeah. kind of... <laughs> look at how ready he turned. Very intentionally <laughs> done. Uh, ah! yeah. so, so what was the... How much of Vecna was published and known when you started this? Was Vecna just a few lines, or was there actually... Oh, it, was, some... it was... Vecna was the stuff that you that everybody had read about in... You know, we had these artifacts, but there yeah. wasn't a whole lot of, like, secret back lore. The Gary may have had some stuff, yeah. but... Uh-huh, yeah. It was, you know... So we didn't have a whole lot beyond that to go with, and so That's yeah. So I started out, yeah, gave me the whole the whole eight, and <laughs> yes, very very deliberately set it up so that they would all die. It's a very and I and I think I won't guarantee, but I think it is put together well enough, and it was all and it was all done completely fair by the rules, right? Mm -hmm. It's time stop, um, but that it was intended that it would be impossible for them, any of them to survive that basically that if you if you played it by the rules uh you know the vecna doesn't you know the vecna doesn't cheat it's just that vecna's smart and he was prepared right yeah um and and the whole point of this was to say because i just wanted that moment when you're going everybody's like you know oh vecna lives this is going to be a great adventure right and then you hand them the circle eight and they're like "Ooh, we're going to play the circle of eight and then you kill them all and then you hand them a new set of characters and you say oh you're all the circle of eight apprentices <laughs> so not only yeah. do you have to then go find out what happened to your your uh, masters right but you are you are basically not as powerful as they are, yeah. and I just played you through the thing that killed all of your powerful players, <laughs> and so just that idea that now now we're going to put you in a position where you're all you know because that then the idea was at least the hope was that instills fear in the players when they go after Vecna. It's not yeah. Like, oh boy, let's go after Vecna. It's like. Holy crap! We got to think about this. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say yes. I, I I was reading up on it before today, and I'm like, oh my, you know, because I have never run this, and I, I I'm I'm. And also to play. <laughs> oh my sorry. gosh! Yeah, go ahead, Anna. But, but also to to play iconic characters from the campaign setting was also a new thing. I think I don't yeah. think that was been in any module where you. Yeah, and that that yeah. would have been something that we would you know. Um, again, this was done after Gary was no longer involved directly, yeah. Yeah. and so that would have been very hard to do uh, when he was involved because mm -hmm. you know then we are messing with people's characters yeah. in a way that yeah. You know, is this pre wars? Mess with them. Is this pre wars or post? This is right before the wars comes out, correct? Yeah, this is pre. Yes, yeah, um, is pre war second edition, but yeah, pre wars. Yeah, th yeah. This is yeah. This is before the from the actions, yeah. I guess. Yeah. So. Um, I, I, so what are your thoughts on 
how this would leave someone's campaign. I know there's a lot of ifs, so I was reading that. Well, if you don't want to kill everyone off, it's okay, but, you know, we want you to do, you know, we recommend you do it, and if they're all permanently, hey, that's not a bad thing. It says specifically, I, saw, I read a line there, it says, if Nystal's dead permanently, it's not a big deal. <laughs> I know there's a line in there that says that. Yeah, but in my campaign, it was awesome because I never played it, but I used it as a forte saying, okay, now the, the, the Circle of Eight are done, they're part of the history, and, and I don't have to deal with the problem, so... <laughs> so, so that was how I used it, so to speak. I was kind of, yeah. Uh, got, and that, and that then was I kind certainly of, possible. But, you know, yeah. it also can be just like Lord Voldemort. You can never get rid of him. Yeah. Permanently. yeah. He's always mm -hmm. going to figure out. You know, that, you could do the same thing with the Circle of Eight if you wanted them. If you wanted them to come back later, they would figure out some way. Oh, yeah. But, mm -hmm. you know, you could get them off stage for a long period of time. So you've done your research on Greyhawk, and then you say, I, I, were, you, were you with Sergeant on this, pre, uh, for the pre-Sergeant from the Ashes? Oh, yes. When, that, when Wars comes out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, I'm not opening, I have, you know, I have it on PDF, but I'm not opening the sealed copy of Wars that I have. So, yep. yeah. Um, but, uh, so this... I wanted to do a, well, A, partially because I wanted to do a board game. Uh, okay. And B, because uh, unfortunately Greyhawk, because of all of the, uh, all of the difficulties in being able to use it as, you know, when uh, uh, between it, it never it never got as much attention or or a, a planned kind of uh, thing as other lines. And so it it never it never was reaching the potential that it could have. Um, and so the thought was, well, we need to we need to shake we need to basically shake the world up so that we can go in and then really kind of work with it in you know, okay. new ways. Um, so, you know, following my tradition of box deaths and blowing up worlds, <laughs> I, uh, I said, okay, well, you know, Greyhawk is very much a, you know, it's a military campaign game. It's a military campaign world, you know, it can, grows out of those old miniatures roots. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very, also a very politically, political kind of world. Uh, so it made sense to have kind of a big global uh, war with a, you know, with a board game thing. Um, and so, you know, that's what we did uh, with the idea that, you know, basically this is going to, you know, lets us then change the borders and stuff how we want in future product. Because we can just say, oh, remember that great health war thing? Yeah, well, this is what the result was. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and what was uh, Carl Sargent already being fed basic ideas and stuff for, for his writing when this came out, or, or was um, that later? I think that was a little bit more later. Uh, uh -huh. He would, but he was, he was, uh, you know, he was definitely. I think he was getting, you know, the he was getting the text before it had gone, gone out, you know. But you know, and so he so, could be inspired so being, by the, yeah. So yeah, so he was definitely being primed and inspired by yeah. this and. Mm -hmm. And he, yeah, he then took it and really said, "Okay, from the ashes," because he got the he got the uh, he got the fun part. Yeah. Which is, now I need to rebuild a world, and mm -hmm. I can, you know, I can do really interest. That's where you get to do the really interesting things. Yeah, yeah. Blowing stuff up is like one thing, but then rebuilding it and trying to figure out, like, well, what kind of new shape does it take? Yeah. Um, All right, that's, so yeah, we got a boatload of questions. So uh, you did a lot of troop movement or a lot of troop discussions and dragon, I believe. Uh, was that because uh, you were from a war game history? Did you play like a uh, uh, War of the Ring, and that's kind of where this box set idea came from? That that game, the Middle Earth one. Oh no, which, God, I was playing you know, was Divine playing Right, S SBI board games. Divine okay, right. Yeah, Divine um, Right. Yeah, Sword and Sorcery. I've been playing. Uh, been playing you know historical war games forever okay. prior okay. to this yeah. and, and right, so cool. a lot of it a lot of it was just you know inspired by a bunch of that the hardest part was trying to trying to get all of those little kingdoms and duchies and everything put in and in a way that would still allow for balanced kind of play because you know some of them are like yeah oh great you're 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 the duchy of this yeah you're going to be doomed you got four <laughs> right <laughs> okay. all more all you, more you, got, you, you have four giant kingdoms all around you and <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah like you you abolished all more and, and and some of the little tiny countries got ran over so yeah yeah so, so you this was open ended and had nothing to do with who what sergeant decided fell or not during the EIU's invasion and, and is that correct or did this have a little bit of influence? There were there were outlines. Um, I, there were discussions and outlines about kind of where they wanted things to go. Okay. Um, and and so yeah, he wasn't he, he didn't I don't he wasn't just given complete carte blanche, uh, but uh, but okay. 
he had a lot of freedom within that and the whole you know the whole i use yeah. thing and stuff was just great <clears throat> yeah um, and 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 to to uh, to blow up the great kingdom was that part of the the his orders so to speak to to, um, to do or was that something he i don't know i don't know if that was i don't know if that was his orders or or was, a lot of it tended to be more about like okay like the eight are not coming back and there were some things we established that you know yeah. these things will happen um and and then a lot of a lot more of it would be was him proposing things and then mm -hmm. getting us to go like yeah okay that sounds like a good idea yeah <laughs> okay wow um very interesting and intriguing so yeah. you, you get to that point and then sergeant just runs with stuff of all the you know if the undying and the mark lands and i use the evil and so were you uh were you uh, uh, assisting I was him not involved really. not involved with that oh, okay, okay. No. Yeah. but i know no, you I were was, doing i have moved on to other things by that point. okay so you're, he was running on that <laughs> Left TSR at that time no not yet no because no, okay. no i was yeah i was doing Working other stuff, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so some other things that were you had that were behind the scenes is and we talked about oh, character yeah. and that was to, to... that was this character eastern uh, realms right is this was... yeah yeah oh that's back to oriental adventures again yeah okay. yeah well then we decided we needed we needed to add this into the forgotten realms and so yeah. that meant a great big map where i took over mm -hmm. like you know more land mass than <laughs> yeah well, the Forgotten Realms got so much landmass that you need a giant planet to fit it all if there would That's be any right. oceans left. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so we wanted to bring that in, and that would also then let us give us a place where we could do Oriental, oriental modules and give them a proper uh, proper okay. setting. Yeah. Um, and uh, because we were getting more and more into the idea that, uh, you know, you didn't, that modules alone don't sell did not sell as well as like source material source material tended to sell better um everybody goes like why don't you do more modules because frankly people didn't buy modules you know when uh, they, you, you need you know, to add classes have, or, or or kind of mechanics additional yeah well the, like the player all, all the all the player handbook series you know those all sell like a ton mm -hmm. uh, because you know hey they were for players and, yeah know, um and then uh, settings would sometimes sell, sometimes not. It was a bit of a crapshoot on them, mm -hmm. uh, this sort of stuff. But uh, source books and you know, the historical, the historical uh, series line, I, I think it did okay. Um, but yeah, modules were always like generally the least selling item. Thank you very much, Chris Solo, for that raid, Fable Forty Two. Thank you. Yeah. Got the legend of the game on uh, David Zeb Cook. So, all right, Carator is one, and I have to. Big Mac's going to kill me if I don't mention this book. <laughs> all right, because I know, and I have to ask another question. So, here it is: Spelljammer Beyond the Moons. All right, which oh, is the, the Cloakmaster cycle. Was Spelljammer? <laughs> it's like was Spelljammer <laughs> an attempt to redo Star Frontiers, or was no. it? No, no, it was not. Okay, no, it was all right. not. In fact, I was I did not design Spelljammer. That was Jeff. Uh, Jeff Grubb? Spelljammer. Yeah, Jeff Grubb did Jeff that. Grubb. Okay. Um, um, it was in part a way. It was an attempt to unite all of our worlds into kind of a single cosmos. Yeah. That uh, that where Spelljammer was the glue that would be kind of between them, um, and so that's why the Spelljammer novels jump around to uh different different settings that we had um and hence it was decided that the first one should take place in dragonlance which was like okay dragonlance is like the most non-spelljammery place i could think of <laughs> okay but i got to i got to, and so i got kind of the task to do this and but it was also comical because i was I was not the most knowledgeable Dragonlance person on the, that we had on the team by far, uh, but uh, but you know, we had a, made made a uh, made a go of it. It's not the greatest novel in the world, but it was fun, and I got to introduce the uh, uh, the Gamja, who is a fairly entertaining character, the giant hippo guy. Cool, run it, giant yeah. hippo guy running around on uh, on. On, on the Dragonlance world because his spell because their spell jammer has crashed here. It's awesome. Awesome, yeah. So I found this Dark Sun. 
Uh, Road Dark to York. York. Yeah, that's a very interesting. That, that was a game world that kind of stood out for for being way different and and raw, cool, and tough. So so yeah. That was that was very deliberate. Uh, on mm -hmm. uh, Troy had was Denning was I think the lead designer for that one, um, and one of the things that they deliberately wanted to do was a kind of take all of the conventions that we had with being of the standard D and D stuff and turn a lot of them on their head. So this is kind of, a, it's a dying world. It's uh, very low magic, but very high psionics. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, it's like also like really metal poor. Uh, so you, you, know, you don't wind up with guys running around, you know, medieval guys running around in plate armor and all this sort of stuff. And it's got like, you know, dragon priest emperors and this sort of thing. Uh, and it was def definitely it was and it was intended to be a lot more, more kind of gritty and like you said, kind of a brutal place. Yeah. Um, cannibal halflings. Yep. Cannibal. <laughs> halflings, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty brutal. That's pretty yeah, brutal to in, say. In that. many ways, I I never played much in it, but I remember buying a few products and and looking at them. And, and a friend of of mine, he he got into to to Dark Sun, and I must say that it's one of the best design game settings I've ever seen. In, one in one of the ways. things yeah. one of the things that they they pioneered with was the let's take a single artist and match them up with a designer and and do it kind of from the get-go <laughs> yeah. as opposed to a lot of most of the stuff we would design it and then we'll go down to art and yeah. you know, somebody but, would it, somebody yeah. would do it and again they'd lobby for it or yeah. whatever. And uh, I but, think oh sorry. No, but this one was deliberately because Brahms' art was generally very different from most of the other artists. Mm -hmm. uh, they decided to, to let him basically do kind of the whole art direction look and uh, on it. And uh, then the, uh, the designers would work, kind of work in conjunction with him as opposed to uh, just, you know, here I wrote this. Okay, make pictures for it, kind of. A yeah, thing, we did but with me, a lot of other stuff. Yeah, me, meaning Dark Sun and Planescape are the ones that production values are way higher than I think anything else yeah. that TSR ever made, so to speak. Production. They are the the high marks of, of of when it comes to to production values and and how well presented they are, the the products are. Planescape benefited from this because we we mm -hmm. got to do essentially the same kind of approach. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, you know, having art time up front to do concept and all this sort of stuff. And it really, yeah, yeah. made a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so for me, those two, even if I, I'm a Greyhawk fan, but, but and, and play predominantly Greyhawk, but I must say that Dark Sun and Planescape, those books and, and as concept and, and production values are, are the, 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 the finest of TSR. Yeah, it's some great stuff. That makes I, us all happy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's it's kind of... Yeah, and and you were involved, and and I don't a know. If, are, are we are we ready for Planescape to dig into to not, that? Not yet. Not yet. Not okay, yet. we wait. Yep. Question: Birthright. Did you have any involvement oh, okay. in Birthright? No, I did not. I did not. I was not involved in Birthright. Okay, because huh? you had that question yeah. earlier. So I, I have a couple a couple other, a couple other things still that I want to mm -hmm. before yeah. we hit the plane. I think Planescape is one of your last publications, if I recall correctly. It is about said. my just about my swamp. That's what I thought. Yeah. So I want to go over some of these other uh, books here. We have this. Um, oh, why didn't it go out there? King Pinch. Ah, yeah. Uh, the Nobles Book One. Forgotten Realms novel. So the Nobles line was just basically uh, independent, independent novels basically themed around nobles' yeah. nobility and stuff. Uh, King Pinch was comes about in part because that's about the time I'm starting uh, working with on Planescape kind of, or I'm, I've gotten interested in the stuff that's going to lead to a lot of the uh, things that show up in Planescape. Uh, most notably, uh, a lot of very uh, Elizabethan and Tudorish kind of, you know, uh, thieves and underworld societies and stuff like that. Yeah. And so, got to play with that in in this in this particular uh, mm -hmm. uh, this particular character kind of comes from that kind of environment, um, and so I got to you know have a good time with that. Yeah, about, that was a lead into factions and 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 stuff like well, that. Oh, you know what yeah. happens what happens when you're when you're a street robber type you know, accidentally mm -hmm. somehow becomes king. Yeah. Kind of wow. <laughs> yeah. Soldiers of ice. 
another yeah, book. Yeah, Soul Device was an interesting one. It was um, basically, I wanted to do a little bit uh, more of a, because uh, we're always doing Forgotten Realms, are always kind of like big, big sweepy fantasy kinds of things. And mm -hmm. me being contrarian, I wanted to do something that was a little bit more smaller scale. Uh, but instead of like, you know, we're going to save the city or we're going to thwart the, the, the giant beholder invasion or whatever. Uh, this was all about really a, uh, uh, a ranger and a failed paladin and uh, trying to save uh, a bunch of gnomes in a valley from extermination by, by some gnolls. So it was meant to be a much smaller, much more focused kind of a thing. Um, yeah. And it built out of uh, kind of the events that had happened in Forgotten Realms, the big sweeping events that had happened in Forgotten Realms where they you know, basically killed a bunch of the gods and did you know, all this sort of stuff. Uh, that this this was just a little bit of a kind of a fallout from that. Yeah. But you know, plus I got to put a uh, a gnome in his uh, in his badger fighting suit on the cover there. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing because gnomes is in many ways they they kind of forgotten race and everybody in, everybody in, thinks it. gnomes are just kind of like goof, you know, goofy and cute kind of. Yeah. And I wanted to make them a little bit more you know. Uh, then I need yeah. to read this book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and and I'm amazed how wide your your skill set is. Meaning you've All done everything over. from from yep. rules and hard crunch to prose and and books and novels and 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 everything in between. Board game designs and and yeah, I'm amazed by the, the yeah, width I get, of I get, it. I get distracted by the next mm -hmm. thing. And so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I got another one, and this one I really want to know, like how you got involved in it and it's, you've seen it going through. And that is, I think these are hidden gems that a lot of people don't know about the green books. And that is this Viking. Oh, the Viking book. Book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is you. And I was like, cause yeah. they're all glory of Rome. Celts are all great. Exactly. Books. They, they were, yeah. They, they, they were fantastic. They, yeah. they, they were kind of a, a advisory line or what was I know, the idea were, behind they, them? It was, yeah. an, it was a little oddball line that a couple of us put, pitched because we were diehard, yeah. uh, diehard history buffs and miniatures players and you know we we do you know miniatures battles and the dungeon shop basement and you know paint up renaissance armies and all this sort of stuff yeah. um and so the idea was like let's let's pitch this idea of doing kind of these historical versions of D, &D um and uh kind of surprised that they said yes <laughs> Yeah. Oh, cool. That they that they let us do it, and then so then, basically, I did this yeah, one, yeah, and the the joy was, and the joy yeah. is basically He's digging kidding. in yep. and trying to figure out like you know what was what would it the historical society kind of like, and then how do you adapt that to a fan to a D and D fantasy stuff that uh, they came with fantastic maps and stuff yeah. too that were yeah and so. Like Vikings is is very low magic and uh, um, but you know has got a lot of really interesting stuff going on in it. Um, the Holy Roman Empire one is you know got you know big societal structure and all this sort of thing. There's even one that is set in um, the uh, I guess it's like early uh, in the. Reformation, Renaissance kind of period. I can't remember right, right exactly when, but it's like early gunpowder. And like Steve Winter did that. And he had a great time researching it because they could find all these things like, you know, they couldn't figure out like, like you know, muskets, if they were rifle, if they rifled the barrels of muskets, that the bullet, the, the, that the bullets went further. And they didn't know why. Right. And the answer was that there were little demon, there were little imps that were spinning the ball as it flew through the air, kind of thing, and that was what they believed, right? And so, and so he was like, "Yeah, this is like great material to work with." The, I, there are so many ideas you can get from these books. I mean, they're mm -hmm. just—they are so hard to get a hold of, though. These books are very, <laughs> some of these books are for over two hundred dollars. Oh I mean, it's, it's crazy, oh, wow. Zeb. It's crazy, man. Yeah. So no. Yeah, you know, the the stuff that didn't sell goes for the highest price. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. yeah, they're so they're, rare. They're yeah, hard they're, to yeah, yeah, they're hard to and, and also later 
collectors yeah. that there are so many more people playing nowadays and, and they want to go back and, and, and find the stuff yeah. that, that only sold a few thousand or something. Or yeah. Like yeah. I think the, uh, the, the player and character green book is the most expensive one. I know the Romans book is really expensive too. Um, you know, so, but, uh, they're just fantastic. And, uh, mm -hmm. yep. I think they're true yeah. hidden gems of the second edition era, all of them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, really, some really neat that stuff. That whole series, the same monster mythology and, and a whole bunch of uh, books that were the same format, so to speak, are yeah. fantastic books. Yep. And the ones of uh, the different races, elves and, and gnomes, and, and those books are, are, are just awesome. Yeah. So you've been a busy, you were very busy during this era, and then comes the penultimate box set, some people say, and here you go, Anna, uh, and that is, yeah. uh, the. this is your baby, correct? The Planescape oh, yeah. setting is you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. yeah so. That was me. I was going mad. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so yeah. So what's the backstory to to start tackling the planes? So and, and, the yeah. the backstory is, goes. It starts with um, we had the manual of the planes. We had and they had redone that, and but one of our other designers proposed a line of handbooks, more like you know the the softbound handbooks. Uh, of one devoted to every plane and you know that we could sell these and, uh, wow. and we said wow that's you know, a that's a lot of work because there are a lot of planes yeah. um, and b we, we we kind of figured that yeah they would sell great when you were kind of moving through you know, hell and all these other ones and then then we get up to the upper planes and nobody want to buy those <laughs> yeah. and so that would be a problem um, and you know it would take you know like years to get it all completed but the idea of doing something with the planes was appealing. Uh, and so then Jim Ward set, wanted to basically, uh, at this point, uh, White Wolf with Vampire and a bunch of their titles were out. And, you know, they were, they were winning the, the look and feel kind of a competition of you know, like, who's got the coolest kind of like, you know, RPG kind of things out there. And he wanted something that basically we could try to, you know, kind of reach to that same same part of the market. Uh, so it was decided that we would do a setting in the plains, yeah. and and uh, then through a through a miracle of scheduling and a little bit of lobbying, uh, the or a lot of lobbying and a miracle of scheduling. I'm not quite sure which. Um, I basically got assigned the job because the guy who was who had proposed the original series of things didn't have time in his his schedules for it, and so so it was okay. I'm going to be doing this planes, and then you start reading about the planes and all this sort of stuff from the manual of planes and all these things, and you go like, oh my god, this place is just bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> but, but how come you take the most boring part of the planes that no one oh, the made any attempt, <laughs> yeah, and, and the, the center that is kind of the most boring Modern part March. of the plane that no one would interest in and make it awesome? How well, because it was also because it was also because it was the most boring part. It had the yeah. most opportunity. Yeah. Um, for uh, doing whatever I wanted because nobody really cared. Now, if I tried to do, you know, I could, you know, trying to set up like, you know, first off, one instruction was one of the things we kind of felt from Spelljammer was one problem was is that players never considered it a campaign of its own. They considered it a way to get from place to yeah. place. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so we wanted to make sure this felt much more like it was its own campaign that it had yep. a, it had a center and mm -hmm. all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so, so that was one important part. The other important part was uh, that they wanted something that was you know had very strong kind of player identity role factions kind of a thing. Uh, and since so that's what all of the various factions that became in the game. Um, so that something that players could just look at and go like, I am this guy, you know, and yeah. that would be their identity in some ways. Um, so Second then, Nightheart. then you start looking at it like, wow, you know, I can't set it in, in, you know, any of the hells or, or, you know, all these other places because, you know, then all, all you get is basically, yeah, I didn't want just, oh, let's go fight giant. Let's go, let's go kill all the demons and take over hell. That's boring. Um, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not suitable to a long-term campaign and it doesn't bring in. So I needed a place that basically was, you know, kind of neutral territory, was neutral territory. Yeah. That means I go to the most boring part, neutral plane. Um, 
well, then I got to make it interesting. And that's where I start to go completely mad. Um, I was, uh, <laughs> yeah. I have What's always the... been a great believer in the idea that magic, and this is one of the problems that D&D and most role-playing games have, is that they commodify magic uh, and it is no longer truly mystical. It is no longer truly the impossible. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm always, I'm always much more of the, oh, you want to, you want to, you know, for this potion, you need, you know, the eye of Newt and all this stuff, but yeah, but you also need the sigh of a cat and, you know, mm -hmm. 16 other weird things that you got to figure out. How do I even get that? Right. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> then basically I wanted to make a, a setting that had that same feeling. And so you just start doing, you know, you can do things in print that you can't do anywhere else, which is like you'd say, ah, this city floats at the top of an infinite spire. And, yeah, you know, was this, this is, yeah, of was course, the, impossible. But <laughs> yeah, what was the city of Sigil uh, invented before? Or was that something you actually invented for Planescape? I, invent, I, I invented the city of Sigil. Wow. Yeah, yeah, because we I never heard, I, I can't remember hearing about it before anywhere yeah. or reading about it. Yeah, reading we, about we, it. Okay. we needed yeah. a home, and so we, mm -hmm. we put it there. It's kind of detached from everything else. Yeah. So it, I didn't have to worry about, you know, somebody could point on a map and say, oh, on this map, it doesn't show up or something like that. Yeah. Um, it... Uh, the whole idea of all the doors was because we didn't, you know, you know, we, the idea is we want to get you out to the plains to do stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but then at the same time, the city itself becomes a much more interesting place yeah. uh, to have lots of adventures. And, you know, why I put it on the inside of a tor of a Taurus, I don't know. I, no, but um, it's <laughs> super cool. It's it's awesome because you, and, and also I think from an artistic standpoint is fantastic because you get like new weird shapes that you can still explain, so, so to speak. So yeah. definitely um, this was again where we, you know, this is the second project where we really figured out like teaming up with a artist right from the start yeah. was a good idea. Um, and in this case, uh, Dana Knutson, who's uh, had a, like a hole in his schedule of about a month. So they said, okay, he's got a month to basically just do sketches and whatever you need, you know, you know, work out ideas and stuff. And so he was actually responsible for defining a lot of the architecture look mm -hmm. and, and uh, came up with the Lady of Pain logo and did a lot of like the fact, the faction symbols and all this sort of stuff. Um, and then uh, when they came to do the interiors, uh, they had worked with Tony Dieterlitzi on uh, some of our other projects. He had done uh, uh, Monster Manual stuff and, and some things like this. And uh, the art director said, "You know, he's got a really he's got a really distinctive, interesting style. Uh, this could work really well here." She thought, and so did the unheard of, which is basically offered him all of the book, as opposed to normally they would parcel this out between you know, different artists. They, and as Tony likes to say at the time, he was young and uh, he, you know, it's this huge, it was this opportunity. And so he said, yes. And then he proceeded to kill himself to try and get it all done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it's an enormous amount of, what is it like 20 or like I have, it's like six inches or, or eight inches of books on my, my <laughs> shelf. And they're all filled with art every page, basically. Yeah. And there's, and there's a ton of art in it. Um, yeah. And, and really, you know, his art really kind of uh, both, he was both informed by what I had written, but I was also informed by his art yeah. and was, would then start to kind of work towards, you know, trying to come up with things that I, that I, you know, you know, perhaps unconsciously, you know, thought that he would be able to illustrate in some cool way. Uh, we also then, you know, the editor got very, and I got very passionate about this particular project. Um, and to the point where we got in fights with like the, the uh, product manager and stuff <laughs> about it. Um, and uh, so that we got like, you know, really good graphic treatment. I even, you know, I was even, you know, to the point where I was like picking out the typeface that we use, which is like kind of yeah. unheard of and these sorts of things. Um, and then you take all that and you top that on, I was on this, uh, kind of binge of uh, reading a, a lot of bunch of experimentalist fiction and surrealist fiction and other things. And so just start mashing all that together. And you throw in the, the Elizabethans uh, thief slang stuff that I had been poking at for a while. And, and you just get this kind of crazy mix.
Uh, but I got to do some really fun stuff with it, and so I was yeah. really happy. So, so was can, it a, a huge Anna, one thing seller quick, when he, Oh, sorry. One thing. We're, yeah. Zeb, I just want to – I always ask this for courtesy. We're over our two-hour time. Are you okay if we go a little longer? Just a little bit. I do want to finish my cake. Just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> All right. So yeah. we're going to wind down a little bit here. I know I don't want to – I don't want to yeah. – you know, no, but, good, Anna. Yeah, good, Anna. I, I was just curious. Was it a, a, a best seller or a good sell – when he came out or is it received more cult think, I status later? I don't think it, it, it got more critical attention than I think it got sales. Uh-huh, um, yeah. Which is, you know, often the you know, the fate of some things. Yeah. Um, so it is, you know, for the people who, who like it, they really like it. Mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of other people, I'm not sure that, it, that there were even, a lot of people were even really aware of it because it's, it's very outside of yeah, kind of it's... normal D&D uh, &D kind of fantasy kind of stuff. Yeah, um, but you know, got enough that we actually, you know, did a decent amount of work in the line, mm -hmm. um, and yeah. uh, and it's still and it's you know something that people still remember to this day, as opposed to lots of other, lots of other settings that we did that you know don't. Oh, you have a very cute dog in the background. <laughs> oh yeah, it's Minnie. She she's a nineteen year old uh, Chihuahua uh, Terrier, and she's blind and deaf, but she's very and she 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 knows her stuff. So and now she gets treats and stuff all the time. So yeah. So, <laughs> She's a Twitch star. Yep. <laughs> we we got through, I think, all of, of Zeb's uh, main publications he put out. Because I think uh, I didn't see anything beyond the Planescape box set. There may have been something that I missed. But there were some minor things I did, and I can't even remember what they were at this what, point. <laughs> and uh, uh, what happened at this point? Had you had enough? Did you burn out? Was it just like it was time to move on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had been working there for about uh, 15 years at that point. And uh, I was, you know, I was senior as I was going to get there. And they don't, they didn't really have like a great advancement track for like, oh, you're just going to be a designer for the rest of your life. Yeah. You okay. know? Um, yeah. So uh, at one point, uh, Lawrence Schick, who actually hired me into TSR, called me up because he had left and gone off to the video game industry many, many years before. Mm -hmm. uh, but he said, hey, he was... Uh, basically helping set up a new division at some company. Uh, and did I want to make the jump over to video games? And by the way, we will pay you more. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, <laughs> yes was the answer. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of the right time to do it. Yeah. Uh, so then I left, went to video games uh, where I have been ever since, though I do occasionally do some freelance work, a uh, little bit, not much, okay. over the years. Um, and uh, but that that's been that's been interesting. I worked uh, basically briefly at a uh, place in Washington D.C. that was uh, a web design shop that was going to go into doing CD-ROM games, and CD-ROM games are the thing. And after about a year and a half, it looked like that was going nowhere. And I got a call from Interplay because they had the uh, they had the Planescape license. Yes. Yeah. Um, and um, Jim Ward, who kind of pointed out to them that I no longer worked at TSR, <laughs> therefore I was poachable. <laughs> Because, you know, licensors were not allowed to poach people out of TSR. <laughs> um, and so they called me up and I went and worked there. I didn't, and they, they wound up doing Planescape Torment, uh, which I actually, oddly enough, did not work on because I was working on another Planescape title that was going to be a first person 3D uh, oh. game uh, that never saw the light of the day because we never had an engine for it. Oh, man. And so eventually I left there, went to work at uh, Retro Studios, was working on a, uh, a fantasy title there that never saw the light of day because they wound up laying off uh, four of the five teams that they had projects that they had going so they could finish Metroid um, there to Boston to work for uh, another company. We got that title out and then they uh this, they shut down our studio so that was fun uh went to northern california worked on uh city of heroes and city of villains ah okay and uh was a lead designer in city of villains and that was fun you know 
got me into got me into the MMO path, which is where yeah. I've been ever since. Mm -hmm. Then oh, I went okay. and worked uh, at two failed MMOs because MMOs are really hard and it's easy for companies to fail uh, yeah. getting them done. Uh, before I finally wound up in Baltimore, of all places, not a place I ever expected to be, and uh, worked for 10 years on Elder Scrolls Online, which I was very, I'm very happy to say is very good and is very popular and is still going strong. Um, and now I'm still at the same company, but I am working on a secret project which we have announced that we are doing a new project and that's all i can say <laughs> very cool Ooh, wow yeah that's awesome that's awesome yeah, it's very secretive i've only done a few tiny minute projects delivering terrain to things and i don't know what game or ended up because it's all like a code word and yes. and, and 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 they send some tech specs and i send some data to them and i receive some money and that's it i have no yeah, clue there you go. And, yes. and it's outsourced to some studio working for some other studio and they can't even tell me what they're working so people say, oh, you worked on something. Yeah, I worked on something, I think, but I'm not sure what. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's the, the standard joke of, uh, of video game developers is, you know, they get together and they're at, at a bar and they go like, hi, what are you working on? And you go, oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, <laughs> too. I'm working on stuff, too. <laughs> yep. Yep. So it's, it's kind of, I, yeah, I haven't even mentioned the code word because I'm not sure I was allowed to mention even that, so to speak. Yep. So, so, yeah, so, so I, I've done, I think, four, four of these projects that I delivered and I have no clue where they, if they ever ended up somewhere or one that didn't get paid because they folded before and oh, then three actually got paid and, 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 and I don't know if they ended up somewhere or something. They'd never tell me. So, yeah. It's funny. Yeah, so video games have been an adventure, but I've been happy yeah. with it. And yeah. uh, like I said, uh, Elder Scrolls Online has been very satisfying to work on. Yeah, um, it's it's and, an amazing uh, and got to make some really cool franchise. things there. Yeah. So um, it sounds like you're happy now where you are, have been in the last 15 years. That's a great thing. Well, yeah. not having to move. We were moving like, <laughs> for three years for a while there. That was yeah. Like, yeah. So overall, your experience uh, in the day, I mean, how would you, you know, what what was your crowning achievement, you think? And what was something that maybe you thought, oh, I, I wish we could have done that a little differently? And then I think well, there's we'll... tons I think we could have done differently. I wish <laughs> I could have done differently. I don't even know where to begin, to be honest. I mean, there's everything from like some modules I look at and go like, what was I thinking about? You know, Earthshaker. There we go. That was a module. It was like, what was I thinking? You know, <laughs> um, okay. to... Uh, to basically, you know, th there are there are things that were beyond my control that were, you know, obviously all of the kind of drama and politics with TSR that I, that hurt it and prevent, you know, possibly prevented it from being all it could have been or could be. Um, it's hard to say, you know, you know, but uh, you know, so there's some of that. Uh, the obviously, I'm very very proud of, of Planescape. I'm very proud of uh, the second edition. I know some people hate it and some I love people it. love it. I it was, it it was a, 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 good, a good step forward in, in my, my yeah. opinion. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A good um, mix. Yep. Too. And Absolutely. I'm really proud of the work with, that I did, that I've done with uh, Elder Scrolls. Mm -hmm. uh, so these things are all that's you a know, fantastic you know, franchise. Yeah. You, you kind of go along and every once in a while something works and really takes off and it makes you happy. Yeah. Uh, so the the uh, the Kind of overall assessment is that I have had real jobs before I got yeah. games, and no matter how awful or weird or whatever uh, game stuff gets, it's still not a real job. <laughs> it's it's something different, but <laughs> yep. it's a lot of work, though. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, you are getting a ton of accolades of thank yous in chat now, saying yeah. people, you mm -hmm. know, as a child, I just loved all your <laughs> publications, and I think that's the general consensus. We got a mo we have. This could be a, a monster show, like in the top three of all time and numbers. And I think it's all because people really respect your work for all the years you really put into it. And I, I just yeah. wanted to say thank you so very much. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know, I know, like, you know, in two hours, we got a lot of content in and stuffed in and we got a lot of questions. Well, and, you were very organized, I got to say. Well, thank you. I try. I try to be prepared. And, uh, and uh, you know, we have some great uh, compilation uh, things where we have some SD experts and stuff. And I'd love to have you back in the future i'd love to have you and jim ward on at the same time down the road and just talk about what what was going on at tsr oh, yeah, we could talk about how i used to drive him crazy <laughs> <laughs> so um um you know uh, 
it is really uh it's really a great um honor that uh, I, i'm so yeah. thankful that you said yes to come on here oh, yeah. and um you know um always you know reach out to us the gray hall community is really huge and the virtual community has really been growing uh but that doesn't mean we're just gray hawk and uh, you know i just you know there's a lot going on out there and i and uh you know if you ever wanted to play you know pick up on a play in a one-shot game i'd be more than ha be honored for you to do that as well just some things to consider and i know you're a busy person but uh and i want to say happy birthday again big 65th oh, thank you yep. so uh so uh anything in closing you'd like to say zeb before uh, yep. we do some shout outs real quick and then we'll, uh, we'll get... um, wow so i think the biggest thing is of all of this the part that always makes me the happiest is when i hear that people have enjoyed something i've done uh that they, that either made them happy or that they said well i changed it and did other stuff with it and that kind of that actually makes me happy too because you know the the idea that you know giving you that i've given you something that you can go off and be creative with is is very satisfying it's I, great to hear yeah it's yeah you've definitely hear. done that in so many ways but yeah probably 20 or more of the, the stuff we we kind of talked about tonight is things that i've, I've used and and loved and and changed and and been inspired by and yeah even Oriental Adventures that I'd never <laughs> went to Oriental Adventures, but I loved a lot of the mechanics and, and it was kind of a, that was a small, a small, a small step, but significant step forward. Oh, for yeah. AD&D and then second edition was a huge step when it came. And especially the magic in the priests that, that they, they started to come of age, the, the spell schools and the specialization and stuff. I just love that part. That was that for oh, me, good. that was the biggest part of, of, of second edition that wizards finally became cool and, and, and multi-talented and all that and priests too. Yeah. Someone said, Hey, right. uh, Hey Zeb, friend of Jeff Lee's in here. Okay. So that was in, that was in, in, in chat. Someone said that. So do you know, is that a friend Jeff? Okay. Okay, cool. I remember Jeff. Very, very, cool. very cool. Awesome. So, um, any anything else you'd like to shout out that's going on, um, Zeb? As we do our shout outs here. Yeah. Just, just you got some things brewing in the in the MMO world, which is great. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, so it's secret projects. Secret projects. Secret awesome. projects. Yeah. That's all I can say. Anna yeah, and I will awesome. move this along quickly. So, Anna, what's going on? Uh, well, um, I'm I'm working on the the whole planet of of Earth to uncover it. Now that the continents, I've done a slight update on that, and climates are coming. So so that very, very the climate cool. on the planet is coming, and and I've I've done a, probably a couple of months of research, and and I picked the brain of, of one of my friends. She she's uh, into oceanography, or or like so so she she's a, a doctor in 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 how the oceans work. So I picked her brain. For, for several uh, several hours on, on Zoom and Skype to, to kind of figure out. And she, she kind of loved it. So I sent her the specs of the planet. We kind of went over and, and the continents and, and start figuring it out, so to speak. So I tried to use my, all my knowledge of weather and, and, and then all the stuff to, to make an interesting functional model of Earth <laughs> according to the Kepin um, climate classification. And it's, it's actually really, really cool. So it, it's coming. It's it's very very soon. I'm I'm writing the article, and I just realized that I needed some more versions of the graphics and stuff for it. So it's coming. Yep, very very soon. <coughs> of course, down the wrong pipe. <coughs> Thank you, Anna. That was the shortest one ever. So that was great. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, All right. I don't want to to run, run I'm, us late. I'm gonna I'm gonna burn through these. So Wednesday night, next night we're on Legends and Lore. We're going to talk about the Sewell, all right? That's our topic on Legends and Lore on Wednesday night. And we, it is myself, Anna Meyer, Greg Mike Bridges, and the special appearance by Lord Bresson himself. <coughs> the community knows who Lord Bresson is. A lot probably of you probably don't know. It's someone's alter ego. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I may need to mute him. We'll see. So he's the, he's a Sewell <laughs> purist. So, uh, mm -hmm. yes. That'll be that is Wednesday evening. Um, you know it's going to be hard to beat the Eric Mona, James uh, Jacobs, and Jason Bolden from last week, but we're going to certainly try. That's on Legends and Lore. Well, we have guests both two weeks in a row, both last week and then, and then this week. Then then it will be kind of a meager show, but we, we'll try our best to. to but there is not meagerness it. coming up. Trust me on this. So oh, the show is not me. Yeah. Th yeah, th 
Thursday night, Saving Silent Clips, the finale. Man, I had a disaster Thursday night. I was a mess, as you all know. I will be less of a mess on our th during our Thursday night game. And someone got their tongue ripped out from a mongrel with a putrid tongue. And everyone was excited. They saw the Tim video for the first time live when someone, uh, you know, and that was in the Karen Hill. So that we'll finish that up. That'll be a Reaper Miniatures uh, sponsor giveaway on Thursday. Saturday night special. Does it? I am so, like... Honored. It's an honor to have Zebulon tonight. I am DMing for Ed Greenwood, okay? Which I still can't get, get my head around it. Uh, Ed Greenwood, Tony Winslow Brill, Anna Meyer, Stella Luna, Eric Boyd, and Eric Mengi. And this is a reoccurring group. Okay, this is not a one shot. Every like six to eight weeks, this group's going to get together again. It's crazy. So we're going to do a little adventure. Uh, in, in, yes, in and I. Ed's playing a Greyhawk Mage, a custom class that was created by my buddy Alan. It's really cool. He's a patron of of uh, of Otto Luke, so uh, and Otto Luke is dead, you know, from the Sergeant era. So he's Jawal Severnain. He, he he who Jawal's the guy he had to go see in Zeb's adventure. Vecna lives because they're all dead too. I was reading that, which is pretty neat. So um, you got to put that on your calendar, and you got to watch us 6 p.m. Eastern time Saturday. Okay, is that, and uh, the characters are all done, ready to go. We got a good mix of players. It's going to be, yeah, it, it's really, childhood dreams, dreams do come true. Dorgum, you're absolutely correct. Now, next two weeks, Gabins. Next week, we're going to spice up our magic user class. Okay, so just like we did the fighter class and the cavalier, I'm going to talk about the elementalist. I'm going to talk about Zeb's wild mage. I'm going to talk about the gray mage. I'm going to talk about the shadow mage. I'm going to talk about the necromancer. All those. So I'm going to talk about that. We spice up our magic user class for old school, but it goes to all editions. The week after, I got another special guest. He just confirmed this today. And so we are going to get... Another guest coming on, which will be pretty nice uh, from that era. Chris Promise will be on in two weeks from tonight. Okay? So, Chris did the Slavers and did a lot of other uh, other content. So, um, there you go, Zeb. Awesome. Thank you so very much for uh, getting on t on Twitch there. Just hit, that, hit the heart button so you follow the channel. That would be wonderful. I would say, hey, Zeb's following us. So, uh, yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you. I yeah. have to go now, so... Zeb, we'll see you. Thank Th you so thank very much. We'll do so the giveaways. Much. Thank you yep. for everything. You. Have thank a great you. night. Talk to you yep. soon. And it was a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. That was awesome. That was great. So um, let me do the giveaways real quick. Yeah. Happy birthday yep. to Zeb. And uh, there you gave Zeb a uh, thank you there, Patrick. Let's do the giveaway. So there you go. Here we go. Giveaways. Going to close them out. Yeah. 565. Anyone else? 10 seconds before I do the giveaways. 10 more seconds. All right, here we go. Closing entries. It was a wonderful guest. Absolute wonderful guest. First, oh, yes. First yeah. winner. Mm -hmm. Oh, did I close them? No, it's not. Let me just go yeah, back you can here. No longer giveaways. The so, yeah, but yeah. No, all right, you ready? You, you got to be on to claim it. These are reprints. Dwellers of the Forbidden City. Uh, his X5 Temple of Death or Book of Artifacts. So we'll give away all three. The first winner gets to choose which one of the three they want. Okay. Yeah, Hager, I'm, you know, we're, the whole community is really growing like crazy. Uh, North Shore DM. Wow. Grats, man. Grats, North Shore. Good to see you win. I guess you're in Michigan, so I'll be sending one of these to Michigan, which is really cool. As long as North Shore is still on. All right. Pick North Shore. Which one do you want? As you're deciding, the second winner is. Uh, and by the way, we're going to raid into someone tonight. I got to figure out who. So, all right. Uh, next winner is. Where's North Shore in there? MN. You're in Minnesota? Okay. I'm sorry. I thought you were Michigan. <laughs> See, close enough, right? North Shore, you decide which one you want and tell me. The second winner. Wiley Scott, you win. Grats, Wiley Hobbit. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. North, sure. Tell me which one of these three you want. Then Wiley, you tell me which one you want second. Third winner. Low. Low 505. I know he's oh. in Chicago. Cool. Yes. So there you go. X. You want the X one? You want X5. Got it. Wiley, which one do you <laughs> want? 
No, sure. Can you uh, whisper me your uh, full name and address? Scott, I think I have your address. And uh, Lo, I think I have your address, but please resend it to me just in case, okay? Uh, so, Wiley, I need to know, Wiley, do you want uh, Dwellers of Forbidden City, which I don't have the reprint in yet, it's coming. So it'll be on delay, or the Book of Artifacts. You just let me know. So, all right. We got a lot of our winners here. Well, um, all right, who are we raiding into? Because uh, I was going to raid into Nightheart Gaming, and they're not on now. So um, I may uh, I may raid into... Uh, I may just go a, a shot in the dark here. Uh, let's see. Wiley Artifacts. Okay, so um, Dwellers of Forbidden City goes to uh, low. As soon as I comes in, I will immediately send it back out to you. I one Wiley Artifacts. Got it. Um, please make sure I have your addresses, everyone. I'm go I'm thinking welcome in over tur Turtle Party Chill. Uh, kind of like welcome in style. How, um, how about Devil's Luck Gaming? How about them? I want to go off the board and someone different. Um, yeah, no problem. Let me take a look here. Oh, Path to Orlay. Hmm. How about, how about, the, how about the Nat 20 show, everyone? I'm going to go into the Nat 20 show. It looks like they got a good T VTT up. Uh, we'll just g give it a shot here. We're going to go, we're going to raid the Nat 20 show. Sound good? Everyone, sound good? Nat 20 show? All right, hang in there. Let's set this raid up. Yeah. Don't forget, Wednesday night, we'll see you. See you all for great legends and lore and a wonderful, wonderful week with uh, some great, with Ed Greenwood coming up at the end of the week. And thank you for all the followers. Um, so we're going to raid into the Nat 20 show and uh, we'll see how that goes. And th thank you there for everything. What a wonderful evening. I, I, I can't yeah. even say... 100 times thank you to Zeb for a oh, monster yeah, that, that was thing so cool. and yep and yeah. uh, um, so we got we got you all uh, lawful if I haven't followed you I'll return the, I'll return the follow uh, as soon as I get off here and do the raid in so all right I'm gonna set up the raid and uh, see you all see you all Wednesday night and please reach out to me uh, community we're having a we're having a blast so uh, yep see you soon see you soon night, everyone see ya. all right let me set the raid up Raid into someone we've never raided into before, which is always fun. The Nat 20. Do something new. The Nat 20 show. All right. So here they got 35 on. Let's see if we can at least double it, maybe triple it. Go in. Get, you know, give them a love. Hang out. Wow. One, over 100. Wow, that's fantastic. All right. Five, four, ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, one. See you Wednesday night. 103. Wow, that's... Man, that was a monster. <clears throat> yeah, that, that it was...